بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Good evening everybody On behalf of Saudi Society for Rheumatology It's my honor and privilege to welcome you all for the first Kraba Symposium virtual meeting in Saudi Arabia As you know, Kraba is a group of research and assessment of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis was organized in 2003 to facilitate sharing of information related to psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. With an annual meeting, have focused on identifying and initiating research projects, advancing standard criteria for psoriatic arthritis, and developing a treatment guidelines for psoriatic arthritis. We are very grateful to the GRABA committee and to the president of the GRABA, Professor Philip Helwell, for their collaboration with the Saudi Society for Rheumatology this year in partnership with Novartis. As you know, one of the Saudi Society for Rheumatology mission is to encourage and enhance exchange scientific thinking with our national and international expertise. GRABA seminar is a unique, effective platform for our colleagues, rheumatologists and dermatologists to advance their knowledge and clinical practice in diagnosis. This professional webinar will be held over two days, tonight from 8 till 11 at Saudi time zone, and tomorrow at 14 again Saudi time zone. We are very glad to have found a selection of such an experts in the field of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis with us to speak to you about more recent advances in psoriasis psoriatic arthritis, pathogenesis, diagnosis, management, and the recent update guideline in management. Also, we have several ch challenging cases present presented by our eminent local uh, rheumatologists and dermatologists. Finally, I would like to thank GRABA committee, all speakers, all chairperson, and special thank for Novartis, the sponsor. And I would like to refer also to the many initiatives that have been taken by Novartis in collaboration with the Society for Rheumatology. Thank you for, uh, all, for all of you for attending this meeting and wishing you a fruitful, successful symposium. And now I will leave the floor for the Middle East and Africa Chief Scientific Officer to welcome you and to present the GRAB group. and I'm the head of medical uh, Novartis, uh, Middle East and Africa. It's really our honor to welcome GRABA International Faculty to the region to conduct this scientific program aiming to facilitate sharing of updates related to psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. The program objective uh, today is uh, to enhance diagnosis and treatment of psoriatic disease by domain and achieve optimal patient outcomes. Novartis is always committed to provide the scientific committee with the knowledge and services they need to raise the standard of care. We would like to thank the Saudi Society of Rheumatology, led by Dr. Hanan Rice. Thank you, Dr. Hanan, for the continuous collaboration with Novartis and our local regional faculty for sharing and presenting a wide range of topics throughout these two days. The meeting will include a number of plenary sessions and interactive workshops dedicated for dermatologists and rheumatologists and will be led by a faculty of 21 regional international and the local experts in the field of spondyloarthritis and psoriasis. With this, I will leave the floor to Professor Philip Hill and Professor Helena Marzo Ortiga. Professor Hillwell is uh, a professor of clinical rheumatology at the University of Leeds, UK, and honorary consultant rheumatologist for the Leeds Teaching Hospitals and Bradford Teaching NHS Trust. Dr. Harrell is a member of ASAS, Assessment of Spindio Arthropathy Society, and the co-founder and the president of the group for research and assessment psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, GRABA. Dr. Herwell is co-founder and lead for the Bradford University Diploma in Rheumatology and Damascus-Skeletal Medicine and the Leeds Foot and Ankle Studies Group. Dr. Herwell has published over 300 peer-reviewed papers. Welcome, Dr. Herwell. Uh, 
And we also have today Dr. Helena Marzo Ortiga. Dr. Marzo Ortiga is a consultant rheumatologist and honorary associate professor at the University of Leeds. She's the clinical lead for, of the multi award winning spondyloarthropathy service at Leeds Teaching Hospitals Trust. Dr. Ortiga is chair, founding member, and trustee of the British Society for Spondyloarthritis and a member of the assessment in the Spondyloarthritis International Society, SS, steering committee. She's an active member of different working groups, including assess, outcome measure in rheumatology, clinical trials. Uh, OMER8 ACT MR group, European League against rheumatology, uh, sorry, rheumatism, ULAR, and the British Society for Rheumatology, PSR. Her particular research interests are arthritis and differentiated arthritis and spondoarthritis. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the meeting and the floor back to you, Professor Herwell. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Hamid. Um, Thank you. It, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all um, presenting this Grappa Symposium with my co-organizer and co-chair, uh, Dr. Elena Martha Ortega. Um, it's a pity we can't be with you in person, but at least we can impart our experience and knowledge and interact with you in terms of question and answers and with the local faculty tomorrow. So I'm just going to give you a brief history of Grappa uh, and, and then uh, I'll pass it over to our chairs for this evening. I've no disclosures or conflicts. I'm not the current president, but the immediate past president of Grappa. Um, so not far off being president, but uh, it, currently it's Christina Callis Duffin. So first of all, we're going to have a couple of polling questions. Um, we'd like to know where, what, what specialty you represent. So would you tell us now whether you're a dermatologist or a rheumatologist? I'll give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. So the majority of you are rheumatologists um, with a good proportion of dermatologists as well. Uh, I'd like to know where you're from. Uh, do you come from the Middle East, the Asian subcontinent, Africa, and there's one below that I can't see elsewhere. <laughs> so vote now, please. And I guess most of you will be from Saudi. Um, so we'll answer Middle East uh, as you are doing but a good proportion from elsewhere as well, the Asian subcontinent and Africa. And one from elsewhere. I'd like to know where that is. Okay, thank you very much for that. So we know a little bit about our audience now. Um, so I'll go back to my presentation. So the numbers have got a bit skewed here, but Grappa has just under a thousand members now. Um, the majority of which are rheumatologists, but about two thirds, one third rheumatologists to dermatologists. Uh, and a, a, a good spectrum of countries are represented, mostly outside North America um, and uh, worldwide representation. Uh, the first meeting we had, as we already heard, is, it was in 2003 in New York. There was a blackout when we all arrived. There were about 20 of us there, um, and we managed to find a hotel with a bit of lighting, as you can see, and thus the organization was founded, and it's grown from strength to strength since then. And we have meetings um, adjacent to the major rheumatology and dermatology meetings every year, uh, and we have an annual standalone meeting, which is, this year is in early July. Uh, and um, uh, this is a two or three day meeting with satellite meetings as well. Uh, we've had some major projects. In fact, um, Grappa grew out of the CASPAR classification criteria project, which I led. Um, but we've since worked closely with OMARACT in outcome assessment. We um, led and uh, uh, produced the GRACE project for new composite measures um, in psoriatic disease. We have 
in our, we're in our third edition of treatment recommendations. Uh, the latest edition having just been presented at EULA, we have a very strong educational strand. Um, we arrange and organize many combined dermatology, rheumatology meetings, and we, um, we co-facilitate meetings such as this one uh, in, um, with other societies. We have a slide collection which uh, is available for use. We have a Grappa app. Uh, we have a number of training videos for um, clinical skills um, uh, training. And we're very interested in earlier diagnosis and in biomarkers. And we've been working on this for at least 10 years and have recently um, been part of a consortium that's now funded as a European IMI grant. Um, so over the next five years, many of the questions we have should be answered by this consortium. This is a sample of the Grappa app. If you haven't got this on your smartphone, I recommend you do download it for free. Uh, it's got a lot on it, including the minimal disease activity calculator, a PASI calculator, the PEST screening questionnaire, the PSED questionnaire. It's got information about Grappa. It's got reference information. So it's a very useful app that you and your patients can download and use. So this is our um, program for this evening. Um, when I've got off the, uh, this podium, I will pass over to our local chairs who will introduce um, in succession, uh, Professor Dennis McGonagall talking about emphysitis, uh, Professor Miriam Whitman, um, talking about pathogenic insights into um, psoriasis and, and psoriatic arthritis, particularly with reference to cytokines and chemokines. Um, my co-chair, Professor uh, Martha Ortega, will talk about axial disease. Uh, Professor Laura Coates will give us an update on the treatment recommendations, not just of Grappa, but also of ULAR and ACR. Uh, Professor Laura Savage, who can't be with us tonight, but as pre-recorded, will give us an update on skin. Uh, and finally, uh, Professor Peter Nash from Brisbane, Australia, it's the middle of the night for him, will give us um, an, a challenging talk, as he always does, on challenging treatment paradigms. And then you'll have a chance to, for a question and answer session with us at the end of the evening. Uh, and tomorrow we have workshops um, co-led by an international speaker and a local um, faculty, uh, two streams, rheumatology and dermatology. And in the rheumatology stream, uh, we shall be discussing uh, implementing treat to target, um, axial disease, enthesitis and dactylitis. And in the dermatology stream, we'll be discussing hard to treat psoriasis nail disease, um, picking up PSA for the dermatologist, um, and finally, um, a differential diagnosis with a particular focus on palmoplantar disease. So that's more or less it about Grappa. We are thankfully well uh, sponsored by the companies you see listed here. Thank you. I'm now going to pass over to tonight's local co-chairs, Professor Suzanne Attar. Professor Attar is a professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at King Abdul Aziz University in Jeddah. She's board certified at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and trained in Ottawa, and she's a fellow of the American College of Rheumatology. Her co-chair is Professor Issam Hamadar, who's a consultant dermatologist at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Centre and an associate professor at Al Faisal University, Riyadh. So I'll pass over to my local co-chairs now. I hope you have a very uh, enjoyable, uh, informative and successful meeting and we'll no doubt talk to you again later on. Thank you.
I repeat, Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah Sayyidina Muhammad Ashraf al Anbiya wal Mursaleen. I would like to thank Novartis for inviting me uh, to chair this wonderful event, as well as I would like to thank Professor uh, uh, Hello for his wonderful introduction, especially he pronunciated the word Abdul Aziz honestly very well. So thank you so much. So I'm going to share the rheumatology perspective. And honestly, we have great speakers today with great topics. Our first speaker is Professor Denise McGonigal, who's a professor of rheumatology and section head of the experimental rheumatology at the Leeds Institute of Rheumatic and Musculoskeletal Medicine. He served as an editorial board in many respectful journals, including the arthritis rheumatism and the annals of the rheumatic disease, as well as he served as a member at the EULAR. I was impressed that he won many international prizes on his work. In 2018, the Werner White Lecture, as well as the Philadelphia Rheumatism Pumperton Prize, and in 2019, the Royal Academy of Medicine Medal. Without any further ado, Professor Denise, the mic is yours. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank Rafa for asking me to speak uh, at this virtual meeting uh, in Saudi Arabia on emphasitis assessment. Uh, here are my disclosures. And basically, I'm going to be not just talking about emphasitis in isolation, but I'm going to try and give you a global perspective on its centrality to psoriatic arthritis and how it impacts on diagnosis and treatment and how we assess it. And I'll briefly mention emphysitis and axial psoriatic arthritis, uh, which uh, is a disease which usually starts outside the sacroiliac joint and is largely a spinal polyemphysitis. So when you think of psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthropathy, you see that there are heterogeneous features, but some of these features, uh, including nail disease and ocular disease and dactylitis, are actually closely linked to emphysitis. And of course, emphysitis is a clinical lesion that differentiates the spondyloarthropathies from rheumatoid arthritis, and this includes psoriatic arthritis. Now, in 1973, almost 50 years ago, when Mollen Wright defined this clinical concept of psoriatic arthritis overlapping with other diseases, uh, they recognized the clinical associations, but not a unified uh, anatomical or pathological basis. Now, one of the things that allowed Mollen Wright to pigeonhole uh, the spondyloarthropathy concept was this commonality of emphysitis in the spine. And these green arrows shows that in psoriatic arthritis, uh, this manifests as new bone formation, which we view as a post-inflammatory sequelae of emphysitis. Now, we're all good at recognizing isolated emphysitis and large insertions, particularly the Achilles and the adjacent retrocalcaneal bursa. But there's uh, 200 bones in the body and um, up to 600 muscles. So there are numerous entheses around the body that are not accessible. And another important thing to point out is that in the Achilles and many other uh, positions around the body, enthesis are functionally integrated with bursae. And in the retrocalcaneal bursa, there's a large uh, synovial cavity. And uh, this entire structure is termed the synovioenthesial complex. We first described this uh, concept in 2007. And uh, so it's important to realize that the pathology targets this entire structure and not just the anchorage point of the emphasis. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the pathology, but clinically, and this is data from the USA, and it, it shows that psoriatic arthritis subjects who have isolated emphysitis as part of their arthropathy, this is clinical emphysitis in orange, uh, have an increased uh, impairment of activities of daily living. So emphysitis is very important to the patient. Now, this is a, a dog knee joint, and this is to illustrate the cruciate uh, ligament, and this is a large and accessible insertion. And there's many insertions around the knee, uh, actually 32 major insertions 
but we only think of examining three, the patellar tendon origin and insertion, and uh, the quadriceps. Now, uh, I know that the medial collateral uh, ligament uh, is included in the Leeds Enthesitis Index, but the, the medial collateral ligament forms an elaborate synovial enthesial complex, which is actually difficult to differentiate from primary synovitis uh, in, the, uh, in the gutter uh, adjacent to the ligament insertion. Now, in 1996, 1995, actually, this paper from Slovenia in psoriatic arthritis showed that some people with psoriatic but not rheumatoid had capsular and enthesial inflammation in these arrows. And in 1998, we showed that up to 40% of psoriatic arthritis patients on the left here had enthesitis inside inflamed knee joints, which was clinically not recognized. So this slide is to illustrate to you the immense importance of enthesitis, not just as an isolated lesion, but as a cardinal central pathological feature that may drive synovitis in a cytokine mediated manner. And because the emphasis is at the capsule, inflammation may spread into the extra capsular tissues, giving extra capsular edema, which is typically seen in dactylitis. So this may be a unified pathological basis. Now, if you look at the nail, the nail is a type of anchorage. Uh, the valves, which are a target uh, in angspond, the spondyloarthropathy, are a type of emphasis. Psoriatic arthritis subjects get anterior uveitis. Uh, that's a type of emphasis. The skin rash occurs over extensor surfaces, which are sites of high physical stress, which is shared with the emphasis. And then in spondyloarthropathy, not psoriatic, but angspond, there's apical lung fibrosis, which is the same site where pneumothorax occurs and blebs rupture because of stress. And then the ileocecal valve is a type of involuntary emphasis. So you can see how the emphasis concept allows you to view disease in a different way. So I'm just going to, going to show you practical uh, examples that unless we see isolated emphasitis, we, like the Achilles, we're not good at it and we miss it. And this is me, right? Supposedly an expert. Uh, so this is a man uh, who um, illustrates uh, synovial joint disease. So this man was 27. He had right shoulder pain and morning stiffness, and he had an effusion in his shoulder, and he had an arthroscopy, and there was no abnormality apart from synovitis. He was actually a power lifter uh, in his spare time, and uh, he had ongoing shoulder pain. And um, here's the effusion in his shoulder. But you see, what was missed was this uh, florid osteitis around the, um, the, the uh, chromioclavicular joint um, at the coracoid region. So there's lots of this diffuse osteitis in a young man, uh, which can be mechanically driven, but can also be inflammatory driven. Um, so uh, he then developed bilateral hip pain and he had an arthrogram of his hip. Uh, he was stiff all day, and then somebody checked the CRP, which was normal, but he was HLA B27 positive. So here you see two years later, he has this florid bilateral sacroiliitis. So he's a non radiographic axial spa. And it turns out um, one of his relatives, uh, first degree relative, uh, had um, psoriasis. So this is another example of this osteitis. So this case illustrates. Um, the, the importance of enthesitis is linked to diffuse osteitis, and we miss that, and radiologists miss it, uh, and it can also be mechanically mediated. So this guy went on to an anti-TNF, but he had disease for several years, and he had three unnecessary general anesthetics uh, in order to explore this alleged mechanical problem. Um, so this bone edema, this diffuse osteitis at enthesis makes things easy to recognize. Now here's a man who's 40 who had severe knee pain with lots of anterior knee stiffness. He had two normal MRIs, he had two arthroscopies. He was going for a third arthroscopy and he had a severe ongoing knee pain. Uh, he, he had no significant tenderness, but on, on passive uh, movement of his knee, he had a lot of pain, particularly when he flexed his knee. He had scalp psoriasis and all his blood tests were normal or negative. 
anti-inflammatories and steroid help. So here he has beautiful cartilage, but what you see here is this edema at the quadriceps. And when you look at the patella view, this is normal, but this uh, one side of the patella has this florid uh, soft tissue change in the emphasis. Now, uh, two, this man responded to depo steroids, but uh, two years later, he, he actually developed a florid um, uh, synovitis and ended up going on a DMARD and things settled. So this is an example of a, a man where enthesitis is difficult to recognize and it wasn't that tender. It was only when the patient flexed his knee and stretched this that the symptoms become uh, 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 apparent. Um, so just to point out that um, isolated enthesitis or enthesitis in clinical trials here you see with uh, IL-17 blockers, secukinumab, resolution of enthesitis occurs in up to half the patients compared to 20 plus cent of placebo. So this is what you see with anti-T and Epsom biologics in general. So it's just very important to point out that nail disease is a predictor of, um, uh, of um, uh, a psoriatic arthritis and it's a type of enthesitis. So this is a 35 year old man in a physical job, pain and swelling in four DIP joints. Uh, uh, all the joints of his DIP, just, just those, uh, and uh, I'll show you some pictures. He had psoriasis, and he also had what he called his nails, nail discomfort and nail pain. So he had no pain in the joint, but pain in the nail. And of course, the nails have no innervation. So here are some pictures. So you see this florid arthropathy and nail disease. And this wasn't tender, but his nails were tender. Now, uh, this is 1956 here in Leeds. Uh, Ma, uh, uh, Professor Wright first showed this strong link between psoriatic arthritis and nail disease. And again, Eileen Tan, who works with me, we've done microanatomy with the late Professor Benjamin. And what we find is that the nail is directly anchored to the extensor tendon of the finger and also to the periosteum. And this is a, a, a ultrasound of the distal intrafalangeal joint in a patient with psoriasis. Uh, uh, without nail disease, and this is a normal emphasis, but in people who have nail disease and psoriasis, but no arthritis, there's often subclinical enthesopathy. So this is common in dermatology clinics. And one of the problems is uh, we find is when we try and tell the enthesopathy from psoriatic and osteoarthritis in the DIP joint, it's very difficult. So here's this osteitis at the emphasis in psoriatic, and here it is in osteoarthritis. So just to highlight that enthesis are anchored to the bone, like a tree is anchored to the ground. So enthesitis may be associated with diffuse osteitis, but if the osteitis is not visible or absent, then it's very difficult to recognize the enthesitis. And again, this is just to highlight that under IL-17 blockade, uh, that uh, nail disease uh, improves rather dramatically out here to 32 weeks. So. The IL-17 pathway is integral to this, uh, this abnormality. So people think of dactylitis as being completely distinct from, um, from um, um, uh, enthesitis, but I just want to show you this overlap. So this is an emphasis in a mouse, uh, Jonathan Sherlock's work, and the mouse emphasis has IL-23 receptor positive cells that can make IL-17. And there's many other mouse models. I've listed four here. Uh, Chris Richland gave me that made this nice slide. And it's just to highlight that these mice get a primary enthesitis, but they always get dactylitis as well. And this all appears to be linked to local IL-2317 immunity. So this is a patient with florid uh, polydactylitis here, 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 here. And uh, so just to show an example, uh, this is another patient with dactylitis, and you can see the plaque here. And what I want to show you is how dactylitis is linked to enthesitis. So this is the accessory pulley, uh, and it's a type of emphasis. Here you see it. And uh, patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis most typically uh, get flexor tenosynovitis. And uh, this middle digit uh, has got florid uh, dactylitis, and this is gadolinium, and it's been injected dynamically, 
And what we see here is the earliest uptake uh, in the dactylitic ditch. It corresponds to this pulley, and then it spreads along the synovial sheath. I've lost my dynamic uh, image to show the gadolinium for some reason. Uh, so yeah, just to highlight that enthesitis and osteitis, or what I call troubled roots, are linked. And uh, when you assess patients uh, with um, enthesopathy, first you remember that it's only really defined around 10% of the cases in the skeleton. Historically, we didn't recognize a strong link with enthesitis. And the reason there's a strong link with enthesitis is because the emphasis anchorage to bone is a site of micro damage and a need for micro repair. And it's important to point out that it's very difficult to tell mechanical enthesitis from an athlete on the left and inflammatory here on the right. So here's a patient with Sappho syndrome and psoriatic arthritis. You can see the sternoclavicular disease. But in this case, they also have florid costochondritis. And the only abnormality you see is this florid uh, osteitis. So just to remember that there may not be much swelling, but quite a bit of bone pain because the enthesitis lesion can be uh, in, in the bone at the anchorage point. Uh, so this is just to illustrate that uh, the, the story about enthesitis is very complicated. And here's data showing that when vedolizumab is used to treat inflammatory bowel disease, Siam Debesh here in leads to this, uh, when the gut disease is successfully treated with an intracrine blocker, uh, some patients may develop a severe uh, uh, enthesitis pathology. So what confounds the recognition of enthesitis? First of all, the target distribution of osteoarthritis and psoriatic arthritis is not dissimilar. And of course, patients with osteoarthritis uh, are prone to various enthesopathies, including plantar fasciitis and uh, also a trochanteric bursitis. So this is a 44-year-old lady with a polysynovitis, enthesitis, and nail disease with a raised CRP and psoriasis, so psoriatic arthritis. So she's treated with conventional DMARDs and doing well. But uh, six years later, she develops pain in her knees and feet. All her blood tests are normal. And she had some mechanical deformity of her knees. And she had a completely normal ultrasound scan. So this highlights this uh, possible overlap of perimenopausal symptoms and uh, true enthesitis. And again, I showed you DIPs earlier. This is a collaborative study of hand osteoarthritis with our colleagues in Germany. And the point here is that psoriatic DIP disease with osteitis and enthesitis in 50% of cases, it cannot be differentiated from inflammatory osteoarthritis. And this is a study from Sybil Aden looking in generalized osteoarthritis and psoriatic arthritis, looking at ultrasound of the lower limbs. And basically, uh, osteoarthritis and psoriatic arthritis uh, in red and green compared to controls have a very similar magnitude of sonographically determined enthesopathy. And this is a patient with there was power Doppler changes in the surface of the tendon and in the synovio enthesial complex. Now remember this part of the emphasis is avascular and this is the last place you will see the power Doppler change uh, uh, and this arises after the inflammation uh, destroys the avascular fibrocartilages. And the other problem we face in psoriasis is that up to 40% of cases uh, have subclinical, um, just checking my time, up to 40% of cases have subclinical enthesopathy. So here's a patient with psoriasis uh, from a paper Zoe I published in Annals here in Leeds, showing this dop power Doppler change at the emphasis in somebody who has no symptoms. So when you start applying imaging, you may find things that don't, do not mean much. Then other things we have to consider is, uh, is fibromyalgia, differential diagnosis and enthesitis. And of course, there's no visible swelling. There may be point tenderness, normal CRP, no autoantibody biomarker, and there may be normal imaging. But generally speaking, patients with psoriasis and enthesopathy have higher ultrasound scores. Uh, so this is just to highlight that unfortunately, the enthesitis indices, the Mander one is the, the first, which is 66 sites here on the right. 
And all of those points broadly equate with sites of tenderness and fibromyalgia. And as I say, there's no easy way around this. Uh, what I do is I may give anti-inflammatories or some corticosteroids initially and look for reversibility to help me reach a diagnosis. So what do I do in practice in the assessment of emphysitis? So I've, I've just shown you how pervasive and widespread it is and how hard it is to recognize. So I ask about sites of pain or discomfort and I apply pressure on those. So I don't go with any particular index. So if somebody is pain, uh, you know, in the back of their neck, I, I will look for the, the spinous processes, tenderness, and I apply pressure. I look for osteoarthritis and fibromyalgia and consider chronic pain. And I will use ultrasound in the peripheral skeleton and MRI in the axial skeleton uh, before considering switching therapy. And it may also factor in on the use of biological therapy. So this is an example of such a case. So this is a female nephrologist uh, who runs a team of 300 and a large dialysis facility, facility. And she has early morning stiffness in her Achilles, patellar tendons and bad costochondritis with the early morning stiffness, but it lasts throughout the day. She saw lots of doctors, a negative MRI, B27 negative, normal CRP, familiar serology negative, there's no reason to do it, but we're looking in desperation for reactive arthritis. She had three ultrasounds and on one occasion they saw a power Doppler one chain, so one site. So this is difficult and she doesn't fulfill spondyloarthropathy criteria. So uh, this doctor got managed to get her on an anti-TNF, this is several years ago, and she's never looked back in her hospital tried to stop treatment. So I'm just going to finish up about axial involvement in psoriatic arthritis. So it's distinct from angst spawn. But it's important to point out that all of this axial disease occurs at an enthesis, like the angulus. It's an enthesopathy, enthesitis, but we cannot examine it. And this is just to show that IL-17 blockade in axial disease, again, is effective. And we know that axial disease, again, here's all of this diffuse osteitis, uh, is, is linked to HLA B27. And we know that the enthesitis of the axial spine also improves on IL-17 therapy. So I've gone a minute over and with that I want to finish and acknowledge all my colleagues uh, in Leeds and including my colleagues uh, in the lab where we study IL-17 biology. So thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that splendid uh, talk and uh, on enthusiasts and that indeed uh, dermatologists uh, need to know a lot about this. It's uh, sometimes we're on the forefront and we do get uh, to refer patients to you for enthusiasts, which we're doing now. Uh, the second speaker is uh, Professor Whitman and um, it's going to, the talk is on pathogenic insights in psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis, uh, cytokines as well as chemokines. Professor Miriam Whitman is, uh, works in the area of inflammatory skin diseases, uh, special focus on the cutaneous cytokine network, and as an associate professor in inflammatory skin diseases in Leeds, University of Leeds. And she's been working in close collaboration with dermatologists, immunologists, and dermatologists on translational uh, projects. And with this, please go ahead and start your talk, Professor Whitman. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, good evening to everybody. So it seems we have a lot of information this evening and I will contribute to the density of information by talking about cytokines. So it seems important to understand their biology better because we use biologics now so often in our treatment. Um, so I would like to briefly address in this short uh, overview, the fact that we can um, block different cytokines and still get good therapeutic effects. And why is that? Why can we block R17 and TNF and R23, and um, all of them give us therapeutic effect in, in psoriasis. 
that seems to be quite unique and not the case in many other diseases where we hardly find one single target. Very briefly, um, I will touch on that we have different targets, cytokine targets in different disease domains. And um, later on in the discussion, I would um, very briefly like to um, address the question whether treating very early and trying to change the course of the disease requires different treatment from just controlling uh, the cirrhotic disease. Let me start by sharing with you what happens in a normal inflammatory response in the body. So let's say we have an infection or we have an injury. The body will respond with an inflammatory um, reaction. And um, once the, um, the trigger is perceived, is recognized, we will have a um, a lot of pro-inflammatory molecules. So we will always see um, mediators such as TNF and IL-1 family members going up. And what happens also in the first phase of inflammation is that white blood cells, blood, uh, you know, um, leukocytes from the blood will start to enter the site of injury, the site where the trigger has been, ex the site which has been exposed to the trigger. And they will try to repair and resolve the problem. And what is really important in inflammatory responses is not only this initial uh, phase where the body tries to either fight an infection or repair a damage, but what's really important is also to then calm down once this repair is done, once the bacterium or the virus is, is uh, eliminated, that things have to come back to normal. And if that doesn't happen, if things don't come back to normal, this is where we have a situation of a chronic inflammatory response. And for psoriasis, I think we have both. We have trigger factors which may be present repeatedly and over time, but we also seem to have the problem that the inflammation, the inflammatory response doesn't calm down. And admittedly, there is less research and less knowledge about that part. What we know is that there is a genetic back background in many patients, which allows more activation of the tissue sets. Right, so I mentioned that at the beginning of an inflammatory response, that white blood cells, leukocytes, are directed to the, to the site of um, an infection or an injury. So a similar thing happens in tissue which is um, where we see cirrhotic symptoms. So psoriasis, as you know, and I refer here, I have pictures from the skin, needs both the tissue cells, the cells which are always in the tissue, like keratinocytes, fibroblasts, tendon cells, but also the infiltrating cells, the leukocytes, which come into the skin. And here you can see a picture of a plaque psoriasis and the histology, the brown dots in the, in the skin, they indicate that we have uh, lymphocytes getting into the upper part of the skin, where normally in healthy skin, we don't see um, leukocytes or lymphocytes in this area. So we have, here this staining is for, for, for lymphocytes, but we, we all know that there are also quite a lot of neutrophils coming into the skin. Um, so let me share with you from a perspective of a skin cell, of a keratinocyte, what happens in a situation of a cirrhotic response from the tissue. So keratinocytes are quite good in knowing what is going on around them, what in sensing their environment. They can, they can sense whether there are bacteria coming on the skin, they can sense um, whether viruses are in the environment, whether there's mechanical stress, but they can also talk to the cells in the vessels, to the endothelial cells, and they sense what's going on in the body. And they do have a repertoire of response they can, they can start, they can initiate. So keratinocytes are really good in knowing what's going on around them, them 
And then there are potent producers of molecules such as IL-36, IL-8 and CCL-20. So this is a staining for IL-36 in the very upper part of the, um, of the skin. If challenged, if uh, stressed, keratinocytes can express IL-36 and we will look into the function in a bit. And you see in a healthy skin, there is hardly any staining for that molecule. Together, the IL-36, the IL-8, which is a chemokine to attract neutrophils, and the CCL-20, which is a chemokine to attract IL-17 producing cells. These pattern of response will lead to infiltration with neutrophils and IL-17 producing cells. I mentioned that trigger factors for keratinocyte is mechanical stress, and we refer sometimes to exposure to mechanical stress as cocorization, infection, and UV can also be a trigger in some cases. Here you see example of cocorization. So this is mechanical stress with a, with a wood spatel with some piece of wood on the skin, this is tattooing, and this was a pain patch on the skin. This is not a contact allergy, but histology has shown that that person developed seratic inflammation under the patch. Dennis, who has just talked to us about enthesitis, um, has also suggested and shown that there may some, be something like a deep Koepner phenomenon, and that actually stressful events can lead to a similar release of pro-inflammatory molecules by tissue in the anterior area and the joint area. So what is important in the cirrhotic inflammation that there is a combination of both a reaction from the tissue, which helps the leukocyte to go to this side, either in the, in the anterior area or in the skin, and that we have the infiltrating cells, neutrophils and lymphocytes coming to this site. If we could block cells from the bloodstream getting into the, the skin or the anterior area, we would not see inflammation. So we wouldn't see redness, scaliness and soreness. And for the skin cells, also in the, in the joint in some places, so for psoriasis, important mediator are the CCL20 and the IL-8. So this illustrates again what can happen in the skin. So in pustular forms, so forms of psoriasis dominated by neutrophils, we think that the IL-36 takes over a little bit more compared to TNF. Both are produced in the tissue and IL-36 has a, has a strong impact to induce IL-8 from keratinocytes, from fibroblast. And then as a result, we have neutrophils coming in. And as you know, this is sterile. There are no bacteria involved. And this is seratic activity. If there is more dominance of the chemokine CCL20, which can be induced in keratinocytes by both TNF or R36, but also by R17, then we have more infiltration of the lymphocytes, which produce IL-17, but also IL-22. And the resulting phenotypes, the resulting morphology is more that of plaque psoriasis. Of course, we still have some neutrophils in the skin, but the dominant cell which infiltrates is leukocytes, which produce IL-17. I'll come to that fact that IL-36 can also act on IL-23, which promotes 70 responses in a bit, back in a bit. So what is the answer to that question? Why do so many different cytokine blocker work in cirrhotic disease? And you know that we can now block IL-23 with the IL-23P19 inhibitors. We can block IL-17 and we can block TNF and there are trials to block IL-36, uh, sorry. 
And the answer to this question, I think, is because they work so well synergistically. So they enhance each other's action. And it's not just an additive response. So it's not one plus, you know, the response of 36 plus the response of TNF, but it's it's really shoots up and it's a synergistic response. And I don't, I, I haven't slide, um examples for every interaction, but just as, as an example, this has been published a while ago and is the best um, investigated interaction, synergistic interaction, is between IL-17 and TNF. On their own, they're not super potent in inducing IL-8. This is the one which attracts the neutrophils. But if given together to cells, to responder cells, it, there is a dramatic increase in IL-8 that can be produced by tinocytes, by fibroblasts, by keratinocytes. CCL20 is the same. The moment you start to combining 17 and TNF, you see a synergistic effect. And if you put in IL-36 into that mix, again the same. It's synergistic with TNF, it's synergistic with IL-17. And the three together can cause real havoc. So this illustrates how three pro-inflammatory cytokines, which really um, enhance each other's action, can cause more problem than just one cytokine. And you can see that when three dogs are fighting about uh, the same piece of toy that can cause more disturbance than just one dog playing. So I think blocking one cytokine out of these three will lower the threshold such that you see less of the inflammatory um, phenotype on the surface of the skin, for instance. I just wanted to come back to the fact that IL-36 also induces or also acts on IL-23 production. And this Charlie from the lab who's now working with Dennis has shown this. And he looked at monocytes macrophages and has seen that the IL-36 is really good in inducing, especially in cirrhotic cells, which is uh, in red, IL-23 production can also enhance TNF, so that's, uh, that also shows the synergistic effect again, but it can also do uh, increase IL-23 production. So to summarize this part, IL-36, TNF and 17 work synergistically as enhancers of inflammation and that drives the, uh, the, the somatic phenotype. As I mentioned before, we need also the lymphocyte side uh, to see the inflammation, to see the morphology of an inflammatory response. And um, as you know, there's different subtypes of T cells. And for the, the ones which produce IL-17 and IL-22, and who are responding to CCL20, to the chemokine, they are polarized. They are, you know, the teacher for these type of T cells is IL-23. So it's upstream of these cells. And you know that other cells in, in allergic reactions are dependent on IL-4 for polarization, but we here in the somatic inflammation, we look at the IL-23 as an important teacher for the effector cells in psoriasis. In this scheme, I just um, visualized that the IL-23 is mainly produced by dendritic cells, macrophages, it works on the lymphocyte, the lymphocyte produces IL-17, but also IL-22 in many cases, which works on bone cells. These cells which produce IL-17 are attracted to CCL-20 produced by keratinocytes. And we also know that IL-23 directly can work and can act on cells at the intesial environment on fibroblast, and that it can act on, cell, on bone cells. So, but why does it not work in axial disease? I think we don't have a definitive answer yet where and when IL-23 plays a role. It was suggested that in the initiation at the very early events of the disease, IL-23 plays a role, 
But later on, once you have ongoing inflammation in the axial disease, it may be less important. So what I've shown you is that we have um, neutrophilic inflammation showing more pustular reaction. We have um, lymphocyte um, infiltration with IL-17 producers showing more the plaque type psoriasis as a phenotype depending on the dominance and that um, different molecules work together to enhance this inflammation. We have 36 acting on IL-8 on, on CCL20, we have TNF acting on IL-36, IL-8, CCL20 and they all activate um, each other and um, support chemokine production to either attract more neutrophils into the, into the skin or into the uh, cirrhotic area or to attract more 17 producing cells, which are further polarized and supported by IL-23. And you see more of the plaque psoriasis here. So in summary, Leukocyte infiltration is directed by tissue cells and is important to see the phenotypes and morphology of cirrhotic inflammation. We have synergistic work, uh, acti activity between 17, TNF and 36, and probably lowering this threshold with any biologics will result in some benefit. And there is crosstalk between the 17 and the, uh, the RLA, the neutrophilic and the lymphocyte dominated uh, pathways. And just as a last thought, I would like to share with you the, 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 um, something about would we be able to really change the disease course if we treat it very, very early on in the disease? And because so far, even with the really good biologics, we're mainly suppressing the, the somatic response. And it could be that we have to, to think about um, a different approach in order to change disease course, because the memory, the memory in, at least we know in the skin, the memory function, which can so easily be triggered again and again and again to, show, to give you plaque and symptoms in the same area, the memory um, cells may respond to other molecules as well. And I mentioned here is IL-15, which is uh, uh, targeted by drug inhibitors, or it may also be that there are epigenetic changes in the tissue. And that may be something which we will look at in the future. And the changing of the disease course may be different than treating an established disease. And maybe this is what the IL-23 in axial disease, where it doesn't respond to established disease, also tells us that the start is different from established disease. With these thoughts, I wish I want to finish and I want to thank everybody who helped also with research in this area. And this is obviously Dennis Group and um, a number of PhD students working with us here in Leeds. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Whitman, for this excellent and detailed session. Uh, I do encourage our audience, please, to type your question and uh, please indicate from which country you are. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is Dr. Helena Marzo Ortega, who is a consultant rheumatologist at the Leeds Teaching Hospital, as well as an honorary associate professor at the University of Leeds. She published more than 150 articles and she's involved as a principal investigator in about six trials. She's an active member of many societies, including the ASAS, the GRABA, and the ULAR. As well as she's a regular scientific reviewer in many esteemed journals, including the Arthritis of Rheumatism. Uh, Dr. Helena will talk about uh, the axial disease, the use of imaging in the diagnosis and management. Dr. Helena, the mic is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being there. And um, it's nice to see that there are so many people online this evening. 
Okay, so I'm going to give you a short uh, talk, which is going to be a clinical take, um, concentrating in one of the commonest pheno phenotypes of psoriatic arthritis, which is the one we call axial disease or axial involvement. And I'll give you a few thoughts about the use of uh, imaging in this area. So I've got a few questions before we start, and I hear that you can all do polls. So I don't know whether you're utilizing your telephones or else, but uh, let's have a look at these questions and then we'll be answering them as we go along in the presentation. So do you think that the following is true? Now I'm putting to you that axial psoriatic arthritis is found in 75% of patients with psoriatic arthritis. That axial PSA can be associated to HLAB27 in over 80% of the, of the cases. That it typically starts in the sacroiliac joints and that more or less over half the patients, 60%, can achieve an assess 20 response at week 12 when treated with secukinumab as part of the Maximus trial data. So let's see what we've got. Okay. Right, we're nearly there, got us flying in. We've got 250 people inputting data here. <laughs> Just a few less than that, okay. Right, so do we do agree on the, um, on the efficacy of Segukinoma? All right, interesting, good. Okay, very good. So keep these thoughts. Okay, and we'll see where we get where, where we get to towards the, the end of this presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so when we talk about spondylophritis these days, we, we tend to think about this artificial divide we've come up in the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. And the purpose of this is just to allow us to select homogeneous groups in order to, to research within this disease area better. So at the moment, we moved on from the Venn diagram that Moll and Wright um, produced uh, in the mid 70s, in which they placed axial spondylophritis at the center with the rest of the related diseases such as psoriatic arthritis or, or inflammatory bowel disease uh, associated arthritis or reactive arthritis as being related somehow. Now, these days we tend to talk more about a primary axial presentation or a primary peripheral presentation. And um, we have placed uh, uh, entities such as psoriatic arthritis or inflammatory uh, bowel disease associated arthritis or reactive arthritis within the peripheral spectrum, as we also do with uh, a large proportion of the so still called undifferentiated spondylarthritis. And we are quite clear as to how to recognize these patients because it is easier to identify a phenotype that starts with peripheral joint involvement, be it synovitis, enthesitis, or dactylitis. But clearly, we do have a subset of psoriatic arthritis, which is not, not as, as numerous as the peripheral arthritis one, which is a primary axial uh, presentation. And the question has been for, uh, you know, for many years, what is the difference between the axial psoriatic arthritis phenotype and the axial spondylarthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, if you like, phenotype? And this is what we've been debating for many years, particularly because we know that up to 10-15% of patients with a primary axial spondylarthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, if you like, a, a phenotype, will also have concomitant psoriasis, and some of them will also have psoriatic arthritis. So the question really is, what is the difference between these two entities? So, We've been approaching this problem from the clinical angle for many years because it was the only angle we had, basically. So patients were coming to clinic and we were making these observations. So, so clearly, whether we talk about axial PSA or whether we talk about ES, is this, um, we, we see that there are a number of, uh, of commonalities. So for instance, we find involvement of the axial skeleton be in the spine or in the sacroiliac joint. Um, we find peripheral involvement with enthesitis, dactylitis, and synovitis, and we also know that a significant proportion will have what the so-called extraskeletal or extraarticular manifestations. 
So some of these, for instance, uveitis tends to be far more common in the context of axial SPA than in PSA. So it will be 30 versus 15 percent, respectively. Now, more or less, the, the proportion of um, inflammatory bowel disease will be similar, about 30 percent in the axial SPAs, about 15 percent in the psoriatic arthritis cases. However, we know that the big difference is psoriasis. So 90% of our psoriatic arthritis patients with or without axial involvement will have a skin psoriasis, whereas only 30% of patients with psoriatic arthritis will develop an arthritis, and of this probably around 20-25% will have a primary axial phenotype. So we have observed over the years that there is some sharing of, uh, of common genes and that a possible family history also makes a difference at the time of doing the diagnosis. But when we look at the prevalence of actual involvement in psoriatic arthritis, this is where we start to get into difficult territory. Because how do we assess the prevalence of a disease entity that we're not very good at identifying, let alone diagnosing? So if you look at the cohorts and the studies that have been published over the years, there's very differences on the, on the numbers that we get. And it's largely because of the population they have studied with some, the majority of them having reported in cohorts with very established disease duration. So for instance, some, um, some cohorts have told us that only 5% of patients with PSA will actually have a sole axial phenotype, whereas some of the data coming from Canada reported that long-standing PSA, 75% could actually have axial involvement, suggesting that axial involvement may actually be accrued over time and may just, correlate, uh, may just sorry, correlate with inflammatory burden and with uh, disease over time. I think clearly at this moment in time, the figure of around 25-30% is probably what you are more likely to find on your uh, early arthritis clinics. And we know that this is probably right because one of the latest studies that has been performed in the UK, and it was uh, Deepak Jadon who, who reported this, you know, has found that whether you look at your patients from the AS angle or the PSA angle, more or less, a quarter of these patients will actually fulfill criteria for either axial SPA or psoriatic arthritis. So, for instance, if you look at your cohort of AS patients, 25% of them will also fulfill CASPA. And if you look at your cohort of PSA uh, patients, 25% would fulfill the modifying of your criteria, meaning that they've already got established presence of sacralitis, which, as we know, takes an awful long time to appear. So there are some differences then at the clinical level, and, and, and clearly this may be related to the endotype, which is determined by the genotype. But, but these diseases are very heterogenic, not only psoriatic arthritis, but also axial spondyloarthritis. So we have had a number of studies identified a large number of genes. And what we can summarize the data as is that axial disease in psoriatic arthritis is more commonly associated with other HLA genes, not necessarily B27. And we'll be touching on this a bit later on. So, one of the objective um, uh, tools that we have, if you like, within the rheumatology setup to identify disease is imaging. And within imaging, x-rays have been the commonest uh, um, you know, tool within our armamentarium to, to look for axial involvement. Now, there have been a number of um, x-ray studies published up to now that have given us an idea of real differences on the phenotype in the axial skeleton between patients who have got a primary psoriatic uh, phenotype or a primary axial uh, spondyloarthritis phenotype. So what we know is that in general, very much as it happens with the peripheral joint involvement that is asymmetric in the psoriatic arthritis um, um, you know, phenotype, the same can be said for the axial involvement. So typically, we're more likely to have symmetrical sacroiliitis or symmetrical syndesmophyte formation or even fusion when we are in the axial SPA case as opposed to an axial PSA. And this is a nice graph that Philip Halliwell published in an editorial last year in which um, you know, he actually highlighted the main phenotypic differences between both entities. So, Dennis has alluded to this before as well. 
Back pain is not as common in the um, PSA field as it is on the axial SPA patients. Psoriatic arthritis patients usually tend to be identified as having axial disease at an older or later age, and they usually have more peripheral arthritis. And, and if you try to understand this, I mean, you can think that it makes sense that when people present with peripheral synovitis or peripheral arthritis, we tend to concentrate more on peripheral joint presentation than what we do on an isolated spinal presentation. So this is why these people, although they are diagnosed with axial disease later on in the disease process, in general, they tend to have a diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis much earlier than uh, their counterparts with axial spondyloarthritis. So axial SPA will present with more inflammatory back pain rather than peripheral joint presentation, and it tends to, uh, to also present as a younger age. And um, clearly, we know that when we look at the, um, at the level of, um, of uh, uh, damage on the, on the radiographs, we tend to see more damage on the sacroiliac joints, including fusion on the axial SPA than on the PSA, in which 30% of the cases may present with isolated spondylitis. And this typically and interestingly tends to start in the neck in the case of psoriatic arthritis, rather than in the lower back, as it is typical of a presentation in axial spondyloarthritis. So we can summarize the uh, um, phenotypic presentation, particularly in the spine, when we use x-rays in PSA as being an asymmetrical presentation, tends to start in the neck, more uh, spondylitis than sacroiliitis in general. So clearly all this must be genetically determined, but, but we are not still, as I've said before, completely sure of which genes determine what. What we know is that if we pull all the data together from the studies with clinical outcomes, the studies that have been looking at x-rays, there's been hardly any data at all on MRI, what we know is that we can identify a distinct psoriatic arthritis um, axial phenotype. It is distinct, but it's not completely homogeneous. So what we know is that you have axial PSA that can be B27 positive or negative. And what is interesting is that 60 to 80 percent of axial PSA will actually be B27 negative. And it has, as we've said, the isolated spondylitis, the later onset, and the primary neck involvement. So this is what, to my mind, is the typical axial phenotype. And it is the axial PSA phenotype, which is primarily B27 negative. However, when you look at the subtype that is B27 positive, which is only 20% of the axial PSA you are going to be seeing in your clinical setup, this is when we actually run into difficulty trying to differentiate this from a true axial SPA phenotype. And we observed this years ago when we did an audit in our clinic, and we actually noticed that our patients with axial PSA had far less inflammation in the spine than patients with similar disease duration and similar bus diet and clinical complaints with axial SPA. It was only when we started to differentiate the cohort according to B27 that we noticed that axial PSA, who was B27 positive, looked the same as axial SPA that was B27 positive. So in, a word, in, in other words, the B27 gene seems to determine the extent and the severity of the spinal osteitis that we see in axial PSA and makes it more similar to that seen in axial SPA. Now, when we look at clinical characteristics and burden of, of disease, well, this is typically uh, similar, um, um, you know, to, to the cohorts uh, uh, with axial and without axial involvement. Now, we know that the presence of axial involvement in PSA can be associated to a higher likelihood of more severe uh, psoriasis, and uh, it can actually uh, have a great effect on, on quality of life. Now, we've just mentioned before about the, uh, you know, it's cervical spine being more involved uh, uh, than the lumbar spine and the sacroiliac joints. Now, the problem we have when people present with an isolated axial phenotype in the context of psoriatic arthritis is, of course, the lack of biomarkers to identify this early. And typically, when people present with back pain, 
um, it's very difficult, um, you know, to work out what the back pain is going to be due unless we do the appropriate imaging, and this should also include MRI earlier on. But um, we don't even have a good uh, definition of back pain in the context of axial PSA, and there has been a, a few studies only that have looked at the performance of the IBP criteria within the axial PSA uh, subgroup. And there seems to be some differences in performance when we apply this IBP criteria in axial PSA and compared to axial SPA. Now, as you may imagine, yeah, it is quite typical for a lot of these patients to go underdiagnosed. And Sibele Dean did a very nice uh, paper a few years ago on a, on a large Turkish cohort in which she found that precisely those patients who presented primarily with an axial phenotype that they didn't, they didn't have inflammatory uh, peripheral um, arthritis tended to take longer to be diagnosed. And of course, they were less likely to be offered a treatment with biologics or other ages. So, so this is the main problem that we have, that, that to put all this data together and to try to understand and characterize this, uh, um, you know, this uh, phenotype is difficult because this is very much an entity in search of a name and a definition. And if you look here, there's been many ways in which studies have been defined in these patients, and there is no one criteria which is equal to the other. So these days we are trying to utilize more uh, the names of axial PSA or even ax PSA, mainly because we are borrowing from the nomenclature that we're using in the axial SPA field. And as you all know, there is now an initiative both from GRAPA and ASSES uh, trying to uh, create a cohort that is going to allow the possibility to uh, study um, axial involvement or longitudinally. This is the AXIS study, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Okay, and just a few thoughts then as to how we should treat. So we've already established that we have problems to name the disease. We've got problems to identify, but of course these patients are real and they need to be treated. And um, uh, Philip has already alluded to the grapple recommendations that Laura will be presenting um, this evening. So just to say that both GRAPA and uh, EULA have acknowledged that the predominant axial PSA is a unique presentation in these patients sometimes, and it needs to be recognized as such. And uh, in this situation, very much as it happens in axial SPA, we know that beyond anti-inflammatories, the only other option is to escalate therapy into biologic DMARs, since there is no evidence for conventional DMARs having any effect here. So there haven't been many studies at all evaluating treatment response in axial SPA, which is not surprising. As you can see here, you know, very small cohorts up to, of course, the maximized trial, which is the only randomized controlled trial we have up to date. So the majority of the, of the indirect data that we have is, of course, coming from TNF inhibitors, although Maximize, of course, you know, was looking at IL-17 inhibitors. Um, and both Dennis and, and Miriam have been alluding in part, you know, to the pathogenesis of this disease. But I think what, one of the things that, that is obviously mystifying for everybody is why is there a difference in the response of the MCCL involvement between the axial and the peripheral joints. And um, Emilia has alluded a little bit to this before, you know, and said that perhaps it is because when we've used the uh, treatment such as IL-23 blockade, for instance, in the spine, we may have placed it too late and we should have been using it in patients with shorter disease duration. But of course, we also know from the work that Dennis and, and his colleagues have done in the lab that there may well be a divergence in the way that IL-23 and IL-17 are mediating disease and the, um, in the thesis in the spine. So I think this is all still an area very much in development. But as I've mentioned before, we have one randomized control trial, which is uh, Maximize, and Maximize aim to address a clinical need, which is to treat back pain in psoriatic arthritis, and uh, it was coming from the angle that back pain in this population was likely to represent axial disease. So that was the inclusion criteria, was patients with a diagnosis of uh, psoriatic arthritis as per CASPA, who had active back pain defined as per vasti and vas spinal pain. And people underwent imaging once they were already on the study, so it was not necessarily an inclusion criteria. 
But as you can see here, this was a primary outcome, which was um, ASAS 20 response on 300 milligrams of secukinumab. So you can see that 60% of patients who were treated did actually achieve an ASAS 20 at um, week 12. And this response was enhanced to nearly 70% of patients achieving the ASAS 20 after a year. ASAS 40 response was also excellent, particularly um, um, you know, replicated on patients who were initially given placebo with nearly 60% or over 60% of this population uh, keeping an ASAS 40 response after one year treatment with secukinumab. And of course, the study did do uh, did acquire MRI uh, to assess the presence of, uh, of active spinal inflammation. And of course, those patients who showed a spinal inflammation showed an improvement after treatment with secukinumab, both on the spine and, the, and, and the, on the SIJs when using the Berlin score system. But Maximize has not answered all the questions. And, and uh, if you read you know, the, the study results in detail, you will uh, find that only 60% of patients who went on to the study with a vast greater than four or the vast spinal um, pain greater than four did actually show some lesions of bone marrow edema on the MRI. And even there were some spinal lesions in 60%, these lesions were not very significant in everybody, meaning the grading of the lesions was not completely, uh, you know, what we would call clinically significant. They were not, ex you know, extensive. They were not intense, perhaps. This all matters because what it's telling us is giving us information about the disease itself. Of course, we still don't have all the data reported, so we don't know what the other 40% had. I mean, did they have concomitant disc disease? Did they have facet joint involvement, degenerative spinal disease? I'm sure a lot of them did because this is what you would expect, not only in a, in a population of, of psoriatic arthritis who are middle-aged, but also in the general population, you know, who, when we match them perhaps for sex and age. So there is a lot of questions still that need answering. But clearly the good news is that IL-17 blockade seems to work. And we also have a little bit more data coming through. Um, the summit study um, did report only on a post hoc analysis. This was using um, IL-23, of course, uh, blockade. But we now have the data from the IL-23 P19 compound, uh, which is being developed um, uh, by Janssen, who is also going to look at um, efficacy in the axial involvement in PSA on a randomized control trial. And this is based on some reassuring data from a, a subpopulation of patients within the, uh, the DISCOVER trials that actually did have radiographic sacroiliitis at the time of study entry. And when these patients were assessed based on clinical outcomes, such as the past diagnosis, the assess responses, it was clearly seen that this had improved when exposed to IL-23 inhibition. So a lot of exciting um, data coming through. So, uh, similar results um, also published with opadacitinib. So we have to watch this space. As usual, as we have done in psoriatic arthritis for many years, um, you know, clinical trials and, um, and you know, uh, clinical studies are going to give us uh, information on pathogenesis. So, so I think this is everything I had to say. So uh, research focus, of course, in this disease area needs to be placed in both phenotype and genotype. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, pathophysiology here remains elusive and we need to, to continue working here, ideally, having biomarkers to stratify uh, not only diagnosis, but disease um, uh, and treatment response is, is highly needed. And hopefully a study such as AXIS are going to give us a lot of information uh, once we are able to characterize these cohorts properly and particularly being able to follow them up long term. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Helena, for this excellent presentation. Now, it would, be, it would give me great pleasure to introduce our next lecture, which I know that some of you are waiting for, which is the update in the recommendation guideline for the treatment of PSA, the ACR, the ULR, and the GABA, presented by Dr. Laurel Coates, who is an associate professor at the University of Oxford, UK. Now, we all know Laurel Coates from her PhD work, which have been focused on the minimum disease activity criteria for PSA establishment in the TACOBA trial. And it was the first study 
to show the benefit of treat to target in PSA. Uh, Dr. Coach is a member of the GABA Guidelines Steering Committee, and she published more than 100 uh, um, articles. Dr. Laura, the mic is yours. Lovely, thank you. Uh, so thank you for uh, joining us and tuning in um, to hear these updates on psoriatic arthritis. So I'm going to talk through some different treatment recommendations, including, as was mentioned, the latest update of the GRAPA recommendations. Um, these are my disclosures. So when we think about treatment recommendations, I think there are three key more international recommendations that are available to us at the moment in psoriatic arthritis. The ACR recommendations published in 2018, ULAR in 2019, and GRAPA to be published later on this year, 2021. So the ACR National Psoriasis Foundation recommendations for 2018 for starters, um, these are not officially international recommendations. They are recommendations for the US and they're designed specifically for that healthcare system. I think predominantly they follow similar patterns to the other treatment recommendations. But, but the big thing that we saw as a change in the ACR recommendations in 2018 is that these were the first recommendations to specifically recommend a biologic as a first line therapy with a recommendation for TNF inhibitors over and above oral small molecules, which includes methotrexate and apremolast. Then if patients fail TNF, they can switch to other biologics. If they've tried oral small molecules, typically in the US because the insurance company requires this, then they can try a biologic. And if they fail alternative biologic therapies like IL-17 and IL-1223, potentially chosen, for example, if someone has very significant skin disease, then you could swap to an alternative mode of action of the biologic. The EULA recommendations are designed to be more international and are applicable in more healthcare settings. And these were published in 2019. So they divide psoriatic arthritis into four key groups. Polyarthritis, patients with more than four swollen joints. Oligoarthritis with four or less. Predominant enthesitis or predominant axial disease because as you've heard from the talks already, that's going to influence our treatment decisions. And they all follow treat to target principles, the aim that we should be looking for improvement in disease activity by three months, and ideally patients achieving a target by six months. So patients with polyarthritis, it's recommended to go rapidly onto conventional DMARDs, methotrexate if they have skin disease, leflunamide or sulfasalazine. And the oligoarthritis is somewhat similar, except that it's slightly less urgent. So in some cases in milder oligoarthritis, you may try anti-inflammatories and steroid injections. But in patients who have poor prognostic factors, you go directly onto the conventional DMARDs. Obviously, for enthesitis and dactylitis uh, and axial disease, there's less data to support the use of conventional DMARDs, negative trials in axial disease, and borderline and mostly observational data in enthesitis. So the recommendation is to try NSAIDs and local anti-inflammatories before then potentially moving on to biologics. So once patients with peripheral arthritis have failed a conventional DMARD, or directly for those with enthesitis and dactylitis, it's recommended to use a biologic. And the big choice in change in 2019 compared to 2015 was that other modes of action came in as a likely first line option in psori psoriatic arthritis. So in 2015, the recommendations very much talked about TNF as being the standard of care. But in the later update, it's noted that IL-1223 or IL-17 could be chosen in preference, particularly those with significant skin disease. If a biologic DMARD is not indicated, then there's a recommendation for JAK inhibitors, but they're not in this recommendation recommended on a par with the biologics. And for patients with very mild disease, there's a recommendation for a premolast. And then if patients fail to respond or lose response to any of these medications, they can be switched to an alternative biologic or targeted synthetic DMARD. 
And so now I'm going to move on to the grappa treatment recommendations as presented at ULA this year. So in 2015, where we last presented the grappa treatment recommendations and there were six main domain groups that looked at the domains of psoriatic arthritis, arthritis, psoriasis, enthesitis, dactylitis, nails and axial disease. And there was one additional group in 2015 that looked into comorbidities. In 2021, we've kept the domain based approach, thinking about those six key domains of disease. But the comorbidities group has split out into two different groups, associated or related conditions, i.e. uveitis and inflammatory bowel disease, where there's a clear pathological and genetic link with the disease, and then other comorbidities, which are slightly more removed from the spondyloarthritis concept. So when we think about overarching principles, these are the overarching principles from 2015 and predominantly they have remained the same with some slight wording changes in 2021. But the same overarching principles are there to think about goals of treatment, including um, treat to target, meeting low disease activity, reducing disease impact, and also minimizing complications, both from the disease and from the therapies that we use talking about patient assessment and clinical assessment of the different aspects of disease and the different methods that we can use to do this, including an assessment of comorbidities, because often that will impact on our treatment choices, individualizing treatment to the individual with shared decision making, and a prompt and rapid re review when patients have active disease and when they're first diagnosed. There are two additional position statements that we presented at ULA this year. So the first is a position statement on biosimilars. This is obviously a big change since 2015 as biosimilars have become available. And so these uh, statements link into the consideration of the evidence for biosimilars, um, how they may be used in practice in terms of switching and pharmacovigilance, and thinking about how the savings from this could potentially be utilised to allow us to treat more patients. There's also a position statement been added on tapering and discontinuing therapy because increasingly, although still in a minority of patients, we are achieving remission and sustained remission in our patients. And I think we're increasingly being asked about the potential to reduce therapy. Obviously, where we can, we want to reduce risks of adverse events from drugs. And so the tapering really talks about using shared decision making, uh, identifying what the individual particularly wants, the optimal approach for tapering for each individual, and being honest about the potential risks that we may not be able to recontrol disease quite as well as before. So this is a summary evidence table that was presented in the grappa treatment recommendations. You can see here the data for peripheral arthritis and axial disease. So I think the big change from 2015 to 2021 is the inclusion of additional medications, JAK inhibitors, IL-23 inhibitors, and also some additional newer data on existing drugs. And in particular, in the axial domain, that's negative trials from ankylosing spondylitis for IL-1223 and IL-23 inhibitors, which will impact on our decision to use these in axial PSA. Thinking about enthesitis and dactylitis, I think broadly these are similar with inclusion of JAK inhibitors and IL-23 inhibitors as new therapies. But also we have slightly better evidence for conventional DMARDs, in particular methotrexate for enthesitis and dactylitis following studies like the SEAM PSA trial, which was a large study of methotrexate versus etanercept and gave us additional data on methotrexate in a PSA population. You can see we've got a high number of drugs approved in the psoriasis domain, reflecting the number of trials that have happened in psoriasis, as well as the psoriasis outcomes in PSA, but still limited and slightly 
less strong recommendations in the nail psoriasis uh, area where a number of the newer biologics have done very good studies specifically looking at nail disease but a lot of the therapies that we use are still a little bit evidence light. And then finally, you can see the recommendations for Crohn's disease, UC and uveitis. A lot of the same medications coming up. Um, we've got uh, early data on JAK inhibitors for inflammatory bowel disease, as well as approved therapies like monoclonal TNF and ustekinumab. So the GRAPA recommendations come together in this flow chart here, which is rather similar to the one from 2015, although it's been turned sideways, so it runs left to right rather than top to bottom. The same key points are shown at the left and at the right hand side of the um, figure where we bring together these different domains and think about for any individual in clinic, which domains are active, which treatments would potentially um, impact on all of those domains and whether there are any additional factors like comorbidities and patient choice that may need to be taken into account with therapy selection. This is the comorbidities table from 2015. This is currently being updated for the 2021 recommendations. You'll see as you go across the uh, table at the top that it stops at astekinumab. Uh, so we need a few more columns uh, to the right for our newer medications. But I think this table in its updated form will be really useful in clinical practice, considering the number of our patients who have significant comorbidities. And Therapy selection is difficult. You've seen in the recommendations that there are an increasing number of medications that we have available, but there's a big issue about choosing the right drug for the right patient. This is a summary of the data from the key phase three trials, looking at ACR20 outcomes at week 12 or week 16 in the major studies. You can see in the gray that the placebo response differs quite significantly for the different trials. This makes it very difficult to compare them. But also, I think you get the idea that if you look at the benefit for the drug in the coloured bars over and above that shown for the placebo in the grey, you've got roughly similar outcomes. And we've seen this confirmed in head to head trials of IL-17 versus TNF in terms of the peripheral joint disease. So there's not a huge amount to choose between the drugs when thinking specifically about the arthritis. In axial spondyloarthritis, it's a very different story. So we have TNF inhibitors and IL-17 inhibitors approved and licensed for AS. And with good data, as you saw in the maximized trial for secukinumab, specifically in axial PSA. We've got good data for JAK inhibitors, preliminary at the moment in ankylosing spondylitis, but awaiting licensing. But in contrast, we've had three different mode of action drugs that are effective in peripheral disease, but have been shown to be negative in ankylosing spondylitis. The jury is currently out about whether axial PSA may be different enough that the axial PSA patients could respond to these therapies. But at the moment, we would not recommend them for use. And you saw that in the GRAPA recommendations because of the negative AS trials. When we think about psoriasis, things can be quite different as well. So this is looking at the same trials, but the PASI 75 from those major psoriatic arthritis trials. And I think here you get an idea of much more uh, variable response rates. So you've got a premolast with quite a low response rate, similar for a tanacept at the rheumatology doses. Good outcomes for the TNF inhibitors but superior outcomes for the newer mode of action drugs. So IL-1223, IL-17, IL-23, but slightly lower responses specifically for tofacitinib in the JAK inhibitor arena. So when we're choosing therapies, I think we have a, a number of different options available to us. And this is roughly how I think about it in the clinic. So TNF inhibitors are commonly used first line. They work across all six domains and have efficacy in IBD and uveitis. And certainly for us in the UK with biosimilars are our cheapest option. Ustekinumab, good for more severe skin disease, also licensed in inflammatory bowel disease and has very infrequent injections, which may be helpful. 
but with negative data in axial disease. IL-17 with good data across all six domains in the GRAPA treatment recommendations, um, positive data in trials in MS, so I would potentially choose this and have done in patients with a history of demyelination over and above a TNF where there may be a contraindication and obviously particularly good for those with severe skin disease but not for those with inflammatory bowel disease. IL-23 for those with severe skin, but not with axial disease, given the negative AS trials. And JAK inhibitors obviously giving us an oral option, but potentially more for the mild to moderate skin disease, although the efficacy in IBD and other domains is useful. So essentially all of the recommendations that you've heard tonight are based on the same evidence, but there are different approaches partly linked to the um, landscape in which they're developed, particularly the differences between US and European healthcare systems. They all still generally follow a step up approach. I think the GRAPA recommendations are particularly useful for considering the different domains, although this has partially been adopted into the ULA recommendations now as well. So thinking about the joints, presence of enthesitis, skin disease, axial disease and comorbidities and aiming to pick an optimal therapy based on these different domains, the comorbidities and a patient preference. I think we should ideally be assessing disease regularly to monitor response, thinking about measuring MDA or a similar target, thinking about the aims, the goals of controlling disease in GRAPA and the push within the ULA recommendations for treat to target, but still remembering that we are treating each patient as an individual and that's really the art of the treatment that we're picking in the clinic. Thank you very much. Uh, that was splendid, Professor Coates, and uh, we from the, as a dermatologist, I find this very, very nice and um, enlightening. Uh, and maybe we can uh, just to get to get, get uh, we'll not use the services of rheumatology anymore, we just use the algorithm How about that. <laughs> of course not. That's, uh, that's very intriguing. And I think what you presented was very nice to show the, the algorithm, but how intricate and really difficult. It's simple, but it's not that simple. You need to really know what you're doing. Thank you very much. And with this, we'll go to the next speaker, uh, Professor um, Laura Savage. And she's going to talk to us about update on skin. How should dermatologists minimize the delay in diagnosis? Professor Savage is a consultant um, dermatologist at Leeds Teaching Hospitals, NHS trust with a special interest in medical dermatology and honorary senior lecturer, faculty of medicine and health at University of Leeds. She graduated from the University of Edinburgh Medical School and is an active member of GRAPA and co-authored their published guidelines on the detection and treatment of enthesitis. Dr. Savage is one of 10 elected committee members for the British Society of Medical Dermatology and a member of the British Association of Dermatologists and European Academy of Dermatology and Neurology. And with this, Professor Savage, please go ahead. So thank you and hello, I'm Dr. Laura Savage, consultant dermatologist and honorary senior lecturer at the Leeds Centre for Dermatology and the University of Leeds. And it's my great pleasure to speak to you today about how and why dermatologists can and should minimise the delay in diagnosing psoriatic arthritis in patients with psoriasis. So before I begin, here are my disclosures. So psoriasis is a chronic immune mediated inflammatory disorder affecting around 125 million people globally. And psoriasis should no longer be seen as a distinct disease entity, but rather as part of a range of systemic disorders brought together through chronic immune dysregulation and persistent inflammation. These disorders include obesity, metabolic syndrome and the other manifestations of cardiovascular inflammation in addition to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and of course joint disease in the form of psoriatic arthritis which affects around 20 to 30 percent of all patients with psoriasis. 
The majority of patients who are destined to develop psoriatic arthritis will do so after the onset of skin psoriasis, with only around 10% developing articular disease first, and then a further 15% developing both the skin and joint signs and symptoms around the same time. And so many patients, um, particularly those with moderate to severe psoriasis, will be under the care of a dermatologist when they first exhibit the signs and symptoms of joint involvement. And therefore, the presence of antecedent psoriasis has led to the opinion that dermatologists are placed at an ideal juncture for the early recognition of psoriatic arthritis, then alert their colleagues in rheumatology to ensure a swift review and timely access to treatment. So in this prospective study from Toronto, where 313 patients with psoriatic arthritis were followed up for four years, the annual incidence of new psoriatic arthritis was 1.87 cases per 100 patients per year, rising to 2.53 cases when only those patients with at least one follow-up visit were analysed. And so in my clinic, uh, we collectively see around 200 patients per month. So this actually equates to 60 patients per year developing psoriatic arthritis in our clinics, which really emphasises the need for vigilance amongst dermatologists. However, even with perceived early recognition and diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis, several studies have shown not insignificant rates of irreversible structural damage at first presentation to a rheumatologist. So in these two studies, one from Dublin and one from Sweden, between 20 and 30% of such patients had radiographic evidence of irreversible joint damage. And that damage was progressive over two years of follow-up, which signifies the need for that early intervention with the aim of reducing damage and limiting any future disability. And therefore it appears that some structural damage may be occurring before the onset of clinical symptoms, which is what usually triggers us to make that referral to rheumatology. And this is likely due to be in part to subclinical disease starting at the enthesis. So several studies as tabulated here have looked at patients with psoriasis and found that a high proportion have enthesitis despite being asymptomatic. So using ultrasound, investigators have found enthesitis in anywhere between 11 and 46% of the entheses studied. The variation in prevalence is likely explained by the different definitions of enthesopathy used and also the different numbers of entheses scanned, which we can see from that central column has varied widely. So we've already heard from Dennis McGonagall in more detail already about enthesitis which is now generally accepted as the primary focus of inflammation in psoriatic arthritis. And Dennis has taught us how at the enthesis, there is a close functional integration between the tendon and ligament insertions and the adjacent bone, where the insertions are splayed like and anchored like the roots of a tree. And because of this close integration, the entheses are sites of high stress and mechanical trauma. And in genetically primed individuals, there is failure of repair due to the absence of normal immune regulation. So this in turn leads to chronic inflammation, which is thought to represent a deep COVID response akin to that seen in the skin in patients with psoriasis. Then sustained inflammation at the enthesis leads to tendon thickening and localized bony changes, including erosions and enthesophyte formation. And then the secondary dissipation of that inflammation to adjacent structures within the synovial enthesial complex. So you may say, well, Laura, that's very interesting, but how is that of relevance to a dermatologist? Well, we know that psoriatic arthritis is a progressive disease, and we now understand that there is this window of opportunity where as clinicians, we can intervene to improve outcomes from psoriatic arthritis. Indeed, it's been shown that if there is a diagnostic delay of a year or more, or a delay in a patient seen a rheumatologist of six months or more, then the patient is likely to have increased disability, increased radiographic signs of damage and a lower probability of drug-free remission. And this is a concept that is extrapolated from a wealth of work in rheumatoid arthritis, where it is well characterized that earlier recognition intervention is paramount as time is bone. And so due to the likely development of asymptomatic musculoskeletal damage in patients with psoriasis, it's therefore really important that dermatologists make that onward referral to colleagues in rheumatology as soon as symptoms emerge and clinical suspicions arise, uh, and also to consider the possible presence of psoriatic arthritis when we're choosing skin-directed therapies. 
However, the assessment um, and diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis is not straightforward. It's difficult at times for rheumatologists, never mind dermatologists. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, psoriatic arthritis is a distinct disease in terms of the arthritides, um, but there is no widely agreed set of classification criteria, even though several have been proposed. The CASPAR criteria is the most widely cited, um, but this was validated as a means of classifying psoriatic arthritis for research studies and designed to standardise the inclusion of patients for clinical trials. The CASPAR criteria is not a diagnostic criteria, and therefore the difficulty for dermatologists comes in determining what is meant by, sorry, uh, sorry, by inflammatory arthritis and then distinguishing it from mechanical joint disease or other arthritides. So in the absence of um, a specific diagnostic test or commercially uh, available biomarkers, the diagnosis has to be made primarily on the basis of history, physical examination and radiographic features. So typical clinical signs will include the presence of psoriasis with a um, potentially with a family history or, or maybe not be, nail lesions, um, enthesitis, dactylitis, uh, distal and or proximal interphalangeal joint involvement um, and spinal inflammation. Uh, radiographically, osteolysis, um, penciling cup deformities as well as ankylosis and new bone formation near joint, uh, near joint margins um, are also indicative of psoriatic arthritis. And in terms of laboratory features, um, patients with psoriatic arthritis are usually rheumatoid factor negative, although seropositivity may be present in 10%. Other features include elevations of the ESR and other acute phase reactants such as the CRP. I think ESR would be uh, usually found elevated in about 40% of patients with psoriatic arthritis. Diagnostic uh, difficulties also compounded by the heterogeneous nature of psoriatic arthritis and patients may present with any combination of a number of different domains of disease. Um, dermatologists tend to be familiar with peripheral arthritis, but may not be aware of the signs and symptoms of dactylitis, enthesitis or axial disease. It's unusual though for a patient to present with just one domain, um, as is demonstrated in the Corona Psoriatic Arthritis and Spondyloarthropathy uh, Registry. Um, whereby I think only 23.6% of the total 2,617 patients with psoriatic arthritis in the registry had a single domain presentation. This chart um, shows a subgroup analysis of 354 patients who were initiating biologic therapy at the time of enrolment to corona. And these patients had a higher prevalence of all disease features with the majority having involvement of between two and four domains only 12.7% had a single domain involved. So these results should increase the awareness of both dermatologists and rheumatologists to the heterogeneity of disease presentations amongst patients with psoriatic arthritis, which of course is important for the development of um, effective and comprehensive management strategies. There are some clinical clues that dermatologists can seek out to help um, assess if a patient has psoriatic arthritis. So the typical age of onset is between 30 and 60 years, and there is typically a time delay of 7 to 12 years between the onset of skin disease um, and peripheral joint symptoms, although um, axial disease may of course develop years later. As part of the history um, or assessment of skin disease, then patients should also be asked about joint stiffness, joint pain, tenderness and swelling. These symptoms often have an insidious onset. Um, the stiffness tends to be worse in the morning and lasts 30 minutes or more. And the pain and stiffness tend to be eased by exercise and worsen with rest. Um, and the pain in the back or the buttocks can wake patients in the second half of the night. There are also some associated conditions where we see a high prevalence of psoriatic arthritis, including IBD and uveitis. And the presence of these should prompt closer observation as should a family history of psoriatic arthritis. There are also some clues on skin examination. So if you see a nail psoriasis, uh, scalp disease or plaques at the gluteal cleft, um, then patients are reported to have a higher incidence of psoriatic arthritis. Um, and again, closer monitoring for psoriatic arthritis development should be provided for these patients. And then the nail in particular is a really strong cutaneous biomarker with over 8% of patients with psoriatic arthritis exhibiting psoriatic nail changes compared to just 40% of those with psoriasis um, and no articular disease. And in patients with nail psoriasis, 
due to that close anatomical and biomechanical link between the nail root and the insertion of the um, extensor tendon. And, um, and the situs of the DIP joint is common and nearly always found in patients with early psoriatic arthritis. So a simple um, mnemonic to remember these things um, that dermatologists can ask and look for to decide if a patient may have psoriatic arthritis is MINDS. Um, so that's looking for morning stiffness, um, inflamed joints, enthesitis, dactylitis, and spondoarthropathy. So some of the things you may see whilst performing your PASI or your body surface area assessment um, include some swelling or tenderness of one or more large joints. You may see fusiform um, swelling of a digit, the so-called sausage digit representing dactylitis. There may be tenderness or occasionally swelling at the site of an insertion of a tendon or a ligament into adjacent bone. So particularly looking at the Achilles tendon or plantar fascia insertion points can be helpful. Um, and then of course, to ensure that any examination is supplemented with questions about inflammatory back pain, um, which typically has been present for three months or more, um, begun before the age of 40 in most cases, is eased by exercise, um, maybe associated with that early morning stiffness, and as we mentioned before, may wake the patient in the second half of the night. So rheumatologists have developed a range of screening questionnaires to use in patients with psoriasis to try and help us as dermatologists with the detection of psoriatic arthritis. And I think perhaps the three most widely used and studied are the PEST, the PES and the TOPAS. They each have their pros and cons in terms of content, um, ease of use and length, um, and of course each perform very well in their development cohorts. However, when compared head to head in clinical trials, such as the CONTEST study, the sensitivity and specificity um, uh, drop considerably, which to me questions their usefulness in isolation, um, but highlights, I think, the need for them to be used and supplemented with additional history um, and examinations we've already discussed. And that core specificity was highlighted in the EDUCATE study where patients with psoriasis were asked to complete the PEST questionnaire in a primary care setting. And in that cohort, 15% of those with a score of three or more, which is the suggested cutoff for onward referral to rheumatology for possible PSA, um, actually had psoriatic arthritis with the vast majority having other musculoskeletal disorders, um, particularly osteoarthritis. So the difficulties with diagnosis that we've touched upon, um, I think underpins what, uh, the need for collaborative working between dermatologists and rheumatologists. So the dermatologist's initial relationship with colleagues in rheumatology focuses on their assistance in confirming the presence of psoriatic arthritis, but then long-term collaborative relationships are imperative um, to provide ongoing optimization for joint disease and then utilizing imaging as required. And then conversely, for the rheumatologist, the dermatologist needs to be readily available to confirm the presence of psoriasis and provide that ongoing input into cutaneous disease control. And then together, both specialties have a role in monitoring therapeutic compliance, adverse events, and of course, screening for other comorbidities. So if you're not fortunate enough to have a combined clinic where you've got both specialties sitting in the same room, um, I think the best means of combining your patient care is for dermatologists to be um, making sure that they're asking about peripheral and axial symptoms at every visit, to be using a screening questionnaire at least annually, um, to ask about function and um, sort of overall quality of life um, with regard to joint symptoms, and then to look for the signs of joint disease as we've discussed during the examination of the skin. And then conversely, the rheumatologist should assess for the presence or deterioration of skin disease um, and also ask about sort of quality of life relating to psoriasis um, as part of their sort of overall psoriatic disease assessment. There are then several ways that each specialty can raise their concerns about poor disease control, which of course will depend on local circumstances. So some centres such as mine in the UK work with the two clini uh, clinics running in parallel um, and then we can access one another immediately if we want to discuss therapeutic choice. Um, other centres work collaboratively by scheduling a regular multidisciplinary team meeting um, with or without patients present um, where they can obviously discuss combined cases and decide on treatment options. And then in other centres, concerns are flagged by email with a named um, colleague 
Um, and those patients um, can then offer, be offered a priority clinic appointment in the other specialty, so as not to delay um, any treatment. In some centres, however, um, collaborative working, I think, is difficult to coordinate due to funding or geographical issues. And in these centres in particular, I think dermatologists need to have an awareness of the treatment guidelines for all six domains of psoriatic disease so that they can consider what would be the most appropriate treatment to manage all facets. Because there are some nuances, you know, in terms of different licensed doses for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, um, or it may be that a patient doesn't quite qualify uh, for a biological on one indication, but does for the other. So, you know, an example would be for a patient with psoriasis and axial involvement, there may be a requirement to use a conventional DMARD or um, oral systemic immunosuppressant, as they're known, um, for the skin. But then these are ineffective in axial spondyloarthritis, and, and the patient should then, of course, be transitioning uh, straight onto a biologic therapy. So that combined care can really benefit those patients, and actually the patient's skin is likely to benefit more from receiving a biologic. So, of course, most biologics now have that dual approval for use in both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. However, therapeutic choice is not as straightforward as uh, you know, a simple licensing. There are some discrepancies in efficacy for the different facets of psoriatic disease. So it can be really helpful to know the data and understand that your primary choice of biologic for psoriasis may be different to that for, from your colleagues in rheumatology who are wanting to treat psoriatic arthritis. So if we look at a recent network meta-analysis for biologics approved in psoriasis from the British Association of Dermatologists, I think this illustrates that point. So we can see that those drugs that are targeting R23P19, so resinkizumab, giselkimab, um, they appear to have the greatest efficacy and tolerability, very closely followed by drugs targeting R17A, such as secukinumab, with then the TNF inhibitors um, lagging behind. However, if we look from the rheumatologist perspective, um, if we look at a recent network meta-analysis here in PSA, we can see how the reverse is true. We have the greatest efficacy demonstrated for TNF inhibitors, um, particularly infliximab and um, golimumab, um, followed by then the R17A inhibitors and then those agents targeting IL-23. So therefore, I uh, make sure that I understand and consider the opinions of my colleagues in rheumatology wherever possible. Um, and I think this is a great summary from Laura Coates, uh, with whom I had the you know, pleasure of, of sharing a parallel psoriasis clinic, psoriatic disease clinic, for many years before she relocated down south to Oxford. Um, TNF inhibitors are favoured by rheumatologists as a means of controlling not only joint disease, but all six domains of psoriatic disease, albeit perhaps with lower efficacy in the skin. If we looked at IL-17A inhibitors, these provide a good compromise. Um, uh, you know, particularly if skin disease is uh, more severe, although of course we've got to not use them, they're not recommended in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Okay, so I think that concludes this section. So just to briefly summarise, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis are no longer seen as distinct disease entities, and dermatologists I think are ideally placed to try and identify early joint disease. We should be familiar with the clinical history and examination findings for psoriatic arthritis, but it's not easy in the absence of biomarkers and therefore multi-specialty working, I think, is paramount to try and achieve best outcomes in psoriatic disease. The presence of antecedent psoriasis in the majority of, um, of patients who are destined to develop psoriatic arthritis may give an opportunity to circumvent arthritis development if systemic or biologic therapy is indicated in the dermatology clinic. And monotherapies for skin and joint disease are advocated in both the dermatology and the rheumatology guidelines. But prescribers must understand and be aware of the nuances of licensing and dosing and routes of administration for the different domains of psoriatic disease. So I want to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take some questions later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Savage, for this wonderful presentation. And lastly, but not the least, Professor Peter Natch, who is a well-known speaker within the field of psoriatic arthritis for the most of us. Uh, he's from the University of Griffith, the professor of rheumatology, Queensland. He's a member 
of the International Steering Committee of the Graba and served as an editorial board member in many journals, including the Annals of Rheumatic Disease. He was recently recognized as a rheumatology citation leader for the top 20 rheumatology journals over the last five years. He published more than 200 articles and five book chapters. Professor Nash will talk about challenging treatment paradigm, and please notice that this session is recorded, so allow a few seconds of lag. Professor Nash, the mic is yours. Hello everyone, Peter Nash from Griffith University in beautiful downtown Brisbane. I'd love to be with you. Perhaps next year the world might return to normal. I hope you're all COVID free. I thank Grappa and Novartis for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you. And today we're going to be thinking about challenging treatment paradigms in the management of psoriatic arthritis. Here are my disclosures. My group have been working with all biological and targeted synthetic DMARDs in the management of psoriatic arthritis for the past 30 years. In a very brief 20 minutes, we're going to consider this topic looking at these six headings. So the SHER group have been focusing on prevention and they have defined preclinical, subclinical and a prodromal phase of psoriatic arthritis before presentation with frank synovitis. And they look at environmental exposures, including obesity. They've looked at second head, either trauma or microbiome related events. And they're looking at ways of early diagnosis and prevent this relentless progression. At ULA, interesting study was presented looking at phenotype and proteomic predictors in those patients who will go on to develop psoriatic arthritis. Clearly more work needs to be done in this area. Our psoriatic arthritis patients are often overweight with metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemia, fatty liver, premature atherosclerosis. And it's been clearly shown that the time to achieve minimal disease activity is prolonged in the obese compared to the non-obese. And if you can get your patients to lose up to 10% of their body weight, then they've got a seven times higher odds ratio of achieving MDA compared to not doing so. A number of groups have been studying the microbiome and gut dysbiosis with gut permeability issues, the presentation of microbial antigens, and the triggering of the IL-2317 pathway driving axial spondylarthropathy, including psoriatic arthritis, and their interventions, including antibiotics, probiotics, diet manipulation, and also uh, fecal uh, transplantation. Unfortunately, this recently presented study looking at the safety and efficacy of microbiota transplantation in active peripheral psoriatic arthritis uh, failed to meet its primary endpoint. In fact, the sham uh, patients did better than the treated patients. So what about early diagnosis and what uh, novel imaging aspects were shown at EULA? The working hypothesis is that a decade of skin disease leads to the development of a prodromal symptomatic state with emphysitis and then the development of synovitis and damage with the potential to intervene at an earlier stage to prevent that relentless progression. We and others have looked in psoriasis clinics where between 10 and 30 percent of patients have undiagnosed psoriatic arthritis and looked at those patients with psoriasis only who have gone to advanced therapies or whether they can still develop psoriatic arthritis despite being on, in this instance, TNFs and 1223 inhibitors. And you can see a small percentage of patients can still develop PSA despite the use of biologics, although I suspect the number is reduced compared to those patients not treated with an advanced therapy. 
So the ultimate study was presented at ULA, looked at an exercise score in PSA and showed that R17 inhibition with secukinumab versus placebo could significantly reduce emphasitis score. Please don't underestimate how much emphasitis these patients have, often without really being aware of it, and they get labelled with fibromyalgia, whereas they may have a responsive element to this psoriatic arthritis. Any future treatment paradigm will require objective measures of a target to aim at and a disease activity score so metrics is important. It's hoped that we'll reach consensus between a target, whether it's MDA or DAPSA low disease activity or remission, and consensus on disease activity measure uh, that has both utility in the clinic, like the 3 vas or important in use in clinical trials like the PAS test, so that uh, the field can move forward with a consensus, one group saying we need to take a domain approach and use the appropriate tool for the appropriate domain, and the other group looking at a more um, generalized index and a state that we should aim for, which is associated with better outcomes. So what about remission induction and therapeutic individualization? We've had an excellent discussion about the treatment recommendations, the GRAPA guidelines being rewritten, and have always taken a domain approach. And here the ULAR 2019 update is starting to be more domain driven, but some of their algorithm recommendations are, are not particularly evidence based, more opinion based, such as where they place the jacks, but at least they've elevated as an alternate first line choice the TNF 17s and 1223. Any treatment paradigm, we have to act as physicians and have a checklist of very physicianly like simple uh, comorbidities that we have to be aware of. We have to start measuring blood pressures, treating with statins, uh, treating uh, drugs, depression, alcohol, and clearly weight as well. None of this is fancy expensive medicine. It's basic good physicianly care. There's been a real renaissance in our therapeutic option for the management of psoriatic arthritis. A number of drug classes are now shown efficacy in clinical trials and out in the real world. And you can make a list of issues that any therapy needs to address to be appropriate in the management of psoriatic arthritis. And then you can select which domain is requiring therapy in your patient are they predominantly axial? Is there gross skin involvement? What about nails? What about uh, uveitis? Uh, what drugs have efficacy of retardation of x-ray progression, etc.? And you can individualize your choice to make it appropriate for the patient you're dealing with. I could argue that the TNFs, which achieve MDA in about half the patients, have been the gold standard drug of choice, it doesn't matter which bio you select, the efficacy is pretty similar and the safety is pretty similar. But we know and love this group now for the last 20 years and any novel therapy either has to be as effective or better, as safe or safer, or more convenient, or have a cost benefit such as the biosimilar. But having used TNF inhibitors for two decades, we are very clear about the adverse effect profile, even though some of these things are not common, like demyelination, inducing psoriasis, lupus-like syndromes, but TB and reactivating uh, viral infections, uh, this question of lymphoma and other malignancies such as non-melanoma skin cancer, these are all issues we've come to terms with, but serious infections uh, are probably the one that stand out the most. You can expect something like four to five per hundred patient years, serious infections in rheumatoid and a little less in psoriatic arthritis. But for the first time now, we are actually seeing some head to head studies in patients uh, with psoriatic arthritis to help us decide which is the uh, most effective and safe therapy for our patients. 
The dermatologists have been doing this for years and have run head-to-head -head studies between most of their therapies. We now have only two to pick from. By now everyone's aware of these two IL-17 head-to-head studies against the gold standard adalimumab, the spirit studies with background methotrexate, the XC study without, the spirit open label, the XC double blind, the spirit had a combined primary output, uh, endpoint of ACR50 and PASI 100 at 24 weeks, the exceed ACR20 at 52 weeks. Both were biologic naive groups. And here's the exceed study and what did we learn? Well, we knew the skin response was far superior with the 17 inhibitor to the TNF, but for some, it was surprising to see how effective on the musculoskeletal system the 17 inhibitors were with the same rate of onset of effect, the same depth of effect, and the same durability of effect out to 52 weeks. So you could hardly separate the TNF from the 17 inhibitor. And the same applied to the patient reported outcomes such as hack DI, fatigue, sleep, work productivity, etc., and also other domains like resolution of enthesitis, dactylitis, etc. Similarly, you couldn't split them on achieving MDA, VLDA, or DAPSA responses um, between 17 and the gold standard TNF inhibitor. But there are a number of other important learnings, in particular. There's a gender difference in baseline disease activity with females having greater activity and males having a higher response to therapy, something we need to take into consideration in planning future studies. We also learned there was important safety differences. There was almost twice as many patients in the adalimumab arm that had a lack of efficacy or adverse events that led to discontinuation from the studies um, compared to the 17 inhibitor. This is the uh, other 17 inhibitor exocizumab show that the results are almost identical. You couldn't separate from the TNF with background methotrexate as far as the ACR responses are concerned and clearly superior effects on skin. But again, there are other learnings. There's twice as many dropouts uh, due to adverse events. The usual kinds of things we see with TNFs like Legionella, lymph node TB, etc. Indeed, there are almost three times as many serious adverse events on the TNF side compared to the IL-17 side in this second head-to-head -head study. Another learning was that the efficacy of exocizumab over the 12 months was very similar whether concomitant methotrexate was used or not, whereas the TNF inhibitor picked up about 10 percentage points of risk. But before we make a safety claim at a clinical trial that include well people that don't have the comorbidities that you and I have to treat every day, we need to start looking at registries such as this 13 registry study a couple of thousand patients with axial spondylarthropathy and look at the very high retention rates and the low rates of adverse events leading to discontinuation. We need more registry data in real world situations with patients with all the comorbidities we treat every day. We're constantly asked about juvenile psoriatic arthritis and here's a study presented at ULA which showed the safety and efficacy in juvenile enthesitis related arthritis and psoriatic arthritis with the 17 inhibitor. There are a number of uh, presentations both at ACR and ULA about the three IL-23 P19 inhibitors that have been used for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and this is just the latest one at ULA showing the TNFIR population of the Selcomab with nice efficacy and safety in patients with uh, the TNFIR situation. 
Similarly, there have been a number of presentations on the use of upadacitinib, the JAK1 selective inhibitor, in psoriatic arthritis from the SELECT PSA 1 and 2 studies. And again, this is the uh, BDMARD uh, failure study uh, showing efficacy in psoriatic arthritis. This drug has uh, <coughs> shown nice efficacy in axial disease, in psoriasis, and in the musculoskeletal domains of psoriatic arthritis as well. With another new kit on the block, Ducravacitinib uh, blocks its selective for TIC2. You might think of that as JAK4. It binds in a different place to the ATP binding site um, and has shown efficacy in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and was presented at ULA. Also presented was the, at ACR was the one year data of the only study ever done looking at the axial element of psoriatic arthritis with efficacy of the 17 inhibitor being shown. But if it's not safe, efficacy accounts for little. All drugs have baggage, the TNS we've discussed, but I think the 17s and the P19s have a different degree of safety that need registry data to confirm particularly coming from the Asia Pacific, where they don't have a reactivation of TB signal and a serious infection, particularly bacterial infection, in our hands is far less common than with the gold standard TNS. About thinking about damage repair and tapering of therapy in patients doing well. Is it possible to reduce or repair damage such as osteoclast-driven erosions in psoriatic arthritis. I don't know of any studies that have looked at this, like the rank ligand inhibitor and the intravenous bisphosphonate has been studied in rheumatoid arthritis. Fiona McQueen looked at arthritis mutilans and showed zoledrinic acid might have a beneficial effect. Similarly, we need strategy studies to inform us about tapering of therapy in patients that are doing well. In this study, treatment was abruptly stopped and nearly all patients flared over the subsequent six months. In this Spanish study, using clinical and ultrasound assessments, only disease duration, duration of the biologic and the duration of the current biologic were the variables that predicted that full dose would do better than tapered dose. Future developments. The recent editorial, Chris Richland and colleagues argued towards using combination therapy to push towards remission. Uh, the risk, of course, is adverse events like infection, but some uh, combinations, for example, bimikizumab and sertolizumab, the TNF and the septic inhibitor, have been used in combination in rheumatoid with efficacy and safety and they propose that we look at using combination approach with differing mechanisms of action to improve our, our response and to achieve more remission in patients with psoriatic arthritis. As the population ages and as the incidence of malignancy increases, we'll have to be aware that the checkpoint inhibitors can induce psoriatic arthritis and we have to learn how to manage these patients if the Trexate, Tocilizumab, the TNS have shown efficacy and safety in this situation, the decision is always continuing or ceasing the immune checkpoint inhibitor in this very difficult situation. Further, cases of psoriatic arthritis triggered by COVID-19 infection have been described, something else to be aware of. And studies are ongoing around the world looking for a biomarker, in this instance flow cytometry, to try and pick a phenotype that will assist in choosing the appropriate biologic for the appropriate patient. And we look forward to the results of these studies because when it was implemented that you use the appropriate biologic for the phenotype, there was a better skin and joint response, although numbers are small and the response was improvement was modest. 
Lastly, the vaccine approach using the dendritic cell therapy has been promoted in rheumatoid arthritis and needs to be considered in psoriatic arthritis. Friends in Munich has long described the association between streptococcal infection and the development of psoriasis vulgaris in children and whether the uh, development of a group A strep vaccine might be able to be effective in preventing the development of vulgaris and perhaps other forms of psoriasis. Given the very strong family history of psoriasis, would it be tantalising to take your patient who has psoriatic arthritis, genotype them, genotype the children, uh, vaccinate the children and see if you can prevent them developing psoriasis and perhaps psoriatic arthritis, a tantalising prospect for research clearly needed. So in conclusion, we've considered prevention and work being done in prodromal and preclinical uh, psoriatic arthritis. We've talked about early diagnosis and some ultrasound imaging. We've talked about the importance of metrics and that we'd love to see a consensus across the, uh, the world. We've talked about remission induction, perhaps the use of combinations, the uh, individualization of therapy now that we have such a wide choice of treatment choices, which drug for which uh, patient. We've even talked a bit about uh, damage repair and tapering therapy and some future prospects that might help us with biomarkers and groups of patients that we need to look out for in the management of our psoriatic arthritis. So I thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Professor Nash, for this wonderful review. I would like to ask all the panelists to join us, please. The first question is directed to Denise. Uh, well, you pointed in your lecture with regards to the infocytis, an inflammatory type versus the fibromyalgia type. So how to differentiate, the question is, is how to differentiate between both the inflammatory versus the fibromyalgia versus the mechanical type? If there is any other way, either clinical or by the imaging or just giving a trial of steroids would be fine. Professor McConnell, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I didn't realize it was directed to me. But thank you very much. And I really enjoyed the talks. And it's nice to see Peter uh, from far, far away. Uh, yeah, the bottom line is sometimes you have to use a trial of therapy. Um, uh, there, there are studies showing a greater degree of sonographic enthesopathy um, in, 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 in psoriasis compared to fibromyalgia. This is work from Italy. Uh, from Mascheroni, who used to work with Philip Halliwell. Uh, response to anti-inflammatories uh, or steroid uh, is, is a, a guide for sure. And remember, emphases are relatively avascular and very well innervated. So imaging may not answer the question. Uh, so yes, you should sometimes consider a trial of therapy. Yes. Thank you. And with regard to the trial of therapy of steroid, do you mean like giving an intramuscular IM or an oral? Uh, I mean, we prefer giving intramuscular IMs of methylprednisolone 120 milligrams or so. Of course, if patients have bad psoriasis, in theory, that could lead to a, a, an erythrodermic flare. Uh, but most of our patients have low PASI scores and uh, they're older, so we don't see that happen very often. Uh, I, I, I know others may have seen it, but I haven't. Thank you so much. Another question for all the panelists. What are your treatment options for patients who are suffering from active SLE in addition to active psoriasis? Thank you. So don't know who wants to take this question, but um, <laughs> it's a challenging <laughs> one. So we have, we have a number of patients where, where actually use tekinumab uh, is, is working quite well. And uh, we, may, we may combine it uh, in some cases with metotrexate, uh, depending on how difficult the patient is to 
you know, and the whole context of the patient situation. But I would say in a situation where you have uh, SLE, obviously you don't want to go for TNF inhibitors. Uh, it seems at least in the small number of patients we have seen with this combination that was sticking them up to R12, P40, R23, even as a P40 inhibitor, does, does a good job. What about the L17 inhibitor? Would it be a good choice or no? For the, it's not ideal for the to control the lupus. So it, it, it probably depends what which disease is a dominant one. And to discuss with the patient, you know, what is causing most problems and what needs to be controlled best. Um, so it's, you know, and often the, we, we keep a, sometimes a, um, a stronger eye on lupus because of the damages can cause. It really depends on the patient, but the, the 17 blockers are better for the psoriasis and less effective in a lupus situation. Did anybody have an experience with rituximab for such a case? I have to think briefly. Because <laughs> um, I do have a patient who have an active SLE and she has skin psoriasis and with the rituximab, yes. actually her skin even got better. Surprise, surprise. Yes, so it's the problem with rituximab from a dermatology point of view is that you give such high dose of uh, steroids when you give the uh, retox, um, uh, infusion, you know, drip. So, and that can sometimes trigger more skin in the longer term. So we, we don't really like systemic, uh, um, you know, systemic prednisolone. As, you know, the, the dead hole injection mm -hmm. seems to be fine, but you know, this, this is we talk that. So, yeah, I mean, there is no, there is no clear guideline about it. And it depends really on the combination of symptoms and, and you may have to try different approaches. In our hands, I can say, Ustikinumab, Plus, perhaps metotrexid in some cases seems to be quite a, a, a successful approach. Okay. Professor, yeah. what, what do you think about that for patients with uh, with SLE as well as uh, skin psoriasis? What's your opinion, please? Who are you addressing? About the patient with active SLE and mm. skin psoriasis. Yeah, I think we, we've had some cases um, who had this and uh, where we were not, we didn't have much of a choice because of limited uh, therapeutic options for the patients. And we didn't see much of a flare when we used uh, TNF alphas. Um, I mean, the, the fear from TNF alphas was not really, in our hands, was not really warranted. I'm sure the numbers were not high. We all, we all, we, we, I agree with Professor Richman that we go first for the astrokinemab, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't work and uh, as good in some of these patients. So astrokinemab, yes, would be the first place, but I think the fear of the of, of the TNF alpha is um, is exaggerated. Well, there's a challenging question: Can we use two biologics simultaneously at the same time within the lower dose? i.e. the all 17 inhibitor as well as the 23 elena this is for you yes so so we have done it yeah we have done it we've been there uh, we've treated probably i think it's about eight patients and we have published uh, some of these and uh, it was very clinical um sort of realities of uh, some of the patients doing very well with a TNF inhibitor for the joint with excellent response, yet the moment we were switching onto an IL-23 or uh, there were majority IL-23 the switch rather than IL-17, we lost control of the uh, of the joints and, and the skin got better. Yeah, so it was these are scenarios in which we had to take a decision. So all the cases we were um, combining a TNF inhibitor with an IL-23 P40 based on the fact that the skin had had a good response to it before, that the safety profile seems to be quite, um, you know, positive and people tend to, particularly in the dermatology said that they have very good survival. So all cases eventually had to discontinue because of side effects, but two of these, um, of these cases, they were the younger ones, and actually did very well for over a two year period. 
And one of the of these um, this, uh, uh, people actually was a young man and he begged us to keep him on combination therapy. And in the end, we had to stop it because he developed sarcoid. So, I mean, it was in that sense, we were really scared up to point, you know, as to the, side, the, the um, safety profile. Another patient got admitted with a really bad pneumonia. So I don't think it's something that we can advocate long term, but it is clear that dual com, um, combination going for two different mechanisms of actions is something that eventually we may be able to refine. Uh, but I don't think we are there yet with the current drugs that we've got available, even at low dosage. We did try the low dosage and eventually everybody had to come off. There was a systematic literature review that was published in The Lancet in 2018, and it showed the uh, the absolute number of infection for patients on the standard dose of biologics versus the combined biologic. Yeah. And as I remember, for the standard dose of biologic, the absolute number was six versus the combined, it was 55. Yeah, yeah 55. correct. So, so that's what we were afraid of. Yeah, no, we didn't have as many as that, <laughs> as much, but but only one bad side effect is enough, I think, per individual, yeah. Um, one of the things we've been um, uh, trying more recently, we've got, we've had a couple of successes combining a uh, targeted synthetic DMARDs, um, you know, jacks, but still it's early days and it's not something we would advocate really. It's just some very certain scenarios. Okay, I think there's a you. lot of data to come out of the US looking at combining biologics with a premolast, where a premolast mm -hmm. is being used as a, a kind of safe methotrexate. We often prescribe biologics alongside methotrexate. Um, so there will be a lot more data <clears throat> coming out of uh, what was um, the Corona registry, now the Coravitas registry. Um, and of course, for combined biologics, we've also got some data from dual variable domain immunoglobulins. So there was an ABV drug, um, which was an immunoglobulin aiming to target both TNF and IL-17 on a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and that didn't show any increased safety problems compared to adalumumab, which was in the, in the trial as a comparator. But it didn't show particularly great increase in efficacy, maybe a little bit better outcomes in the skin responses, as mm -hmm. you might expect if it included IL-17. Mm. Thank you. Professor Sam, do you have any rheumatologic uh, questions from your side? Uh, because I yeah. do have couple of rheumatology. Yeah, well, there, there is, um, yeah, that's, if there, is there any data and for how long patients remain in remission after Cosentix? Maximum period pa uh, patients will remain disease-free after Cosentix. That's um, maybe for uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, Laura? Yes, yeah, no, I can answer right. that one. Um, so yeah, there is some data from the uh, erasure and fixture extension studies. Um, so those patients who uh, had achieved PASI 75 at week 52, they were re-randomized to receive either continued secukinumab or placebo. Um, and then if the patients in the placebo group obviously then lost uh, response, and that was defined as a 50% more or more loss from their maximum PASI that they'd achieved their PASI response, then they were put back on to secukinumab. And actually, in that study, actually, um, the sort of response rates of patients recapturing was pretty, pretty good. So for patients who had achieved PARSI 75 beforehand, um, I think the time to loss of response was about 28 weeks from memory. Um, for the patients who were, had achieved PARSI 75, then it, it was about 94, 95% of them re-achieved PARSI 75. A little bit lower for PARSI 90, somewhere more around 78%, but, um, but very encouraging. I mean, obviously, we, we, we tend not to encourage switching, stopping, coming off and going back on again just for the risk of, sort of anti-drug anti -drug antibody formation. Um, but but there's certainly the trial data was, was encouraging from, from that extension study. Thank you. Helena, there's a question for you. In one of your slides, you mentioned to, to image all patients with psoriatic arthritis for the back. And no. the question is, well, uh, it seems that there was a misunderstanding. <laughs> I said the opposite. Yes. <laughs> okay. Because the question is, should we image all the patients with their back with x-ray versus MRI? And what's the benefit? Okay. So, no, I would not no. okay to do that because we do not have the data to suggest that, you know, the, there is an academic question there if you want to characterize your patient, but we don't have the data to suggest that that is going necessarily to change your uh, treatment decision making. 
I think if the, if the patient has got a clear diagnosis and they've got enough peripheral joint disease and you are going to treat, you may not necessarily need to look for the axial involvement, but it will always be advisable to characterize your patient well, particularly at baseline. And in that scenario, but I, I would advocate to get as much information as possible. Um, with regards to which imaging uh, method, uh, we tend to use x-rays at baseline for peripheral joints. And uh, if the patient is, uh, you know, around 30 years of age, definitely, you know, older than 20, we like to do x-rays as well. And we would characterize the cervical spine, the lumbar spine and the SIJs. But we do not re repeat that routinely. It's not something we put a uh, weight on. And with regards to MRI, um, I think there is no indication to do a MRI routinely in these people. Uh, we know from the little data that we have that even in the presence of significant vast dyes, the chances of finding um, um, inflammatory lesions are not as high as in the context of axial SPA, where we would expect 70 to 80 percent of patients to have abnormalities. I think in these patients, if I less than that, it's probably around 40 percent. Um, so, so unless you need it and you want to answer a clear question, my patient has back pain, I'm not sure what's going on, I really want to exclude inflammatory disease or else, because what you would find is that you do an MRI and you're going to find an awful lot of disc disease and facet joint involvements and, and that is all good because you're characterizing your patient. But I would say go with your clinical argument. At this moment in time, I would not advocate that every single PSA patient should have an MRI of the back. There will be some data coming with some of the studies that are, um, you know, currently um, ongoing. So it will be interesting to have. But I think your pickup rate is definitely going to be lower than in axial SPI for inflammation. Thank you so much. Professor, any dermatology question from your side? Well, that's my question myself to the, to the, to the dermatologist. We've been following up patients for maybe sometimes 15 years and they keep on having this lingering uh, enthusiasm and it does not develop into something worse. Many, many of them just keeps on lingering. So, and I see your data and uh, the way that's being presented that it's um, the enthusiasm is going to be worse and worse and worse, etc. cetera. Um, I think that most of the patients actually do not develop and they just are stable. The enthusiasm level keeps on being the same. It just comes up and down with triggers like cold, cold weather, uh, infections, etc., uh, trauma, exercise. But I mean, we see, you see the bad ones because you are going to see the ones who are very symptomatic. We see the ones who are not really symptomatic, but they are just a chronic, very mild, Enthesitis. And if they have morning stiffness, uh, it just interferes a little bit with their uh, activities. So what is your say on that? Do, do we consider this as a, something that we have to address right now and treat with biologics or systemics or just observe? Philip, that's for you, I think. Pardon? Yeah, I, um, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, before I make the answer to this question, because we're well over time now and Dennis yeah. has had to leave and I'm sure others may have to, but um, I, I do think we see a lot of people like this. I think there's some uh, question marks about whether it's true enthesitis here. As Dennis uh, clearly pointed out, you know, there's an overlap between the clinical presentation of true enthesitis, polyenthesitis and fibromyalgia. I think that has to be confirmed first. I think low-grade enthesitis can occur, but it doesn't have the same implications as low-grade synovitis, which may lead to joint, subsequent joint damage. So I wouldn't be so keen on plowing ahead with biologics in that group. I think I'd be more, um, uh, more um, keen to observe. Of course, if it's affecting their function and quality of life, that's a different matter. But I think it all depends on a full evaluation of the patient, looking at what's causing this problem uh, and trying to take all that into consideration before making treatment decisions. Thank you. Okay. I think we're already 30 minutes past time. We do have lots of questions, but we're 30 minutes past time. I would like to thank everybody for, for attending and staying honestly this late. 
and thanking all the speakers for the great presentation today and uh, Professor Assam. And inshallah, see you the rest for tomorrow, the second day of the Graba. Please, please do not leave until you complete the survey. It will help us to improve our, uh, to improve the situation and to know how to do better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye.